So guys, what we want to focus on is, we want to ask you as well what you would like to get out of this part of the strategies. I think I'm going to cover quite a lot now. But what I want to first start with is what the best strategies are in terms of success right now pretty fast, right? What are people doing? Where are people getting success? They all work, but what are the best ones to sort of get started for you? Okay, so we're going to be going through each strategy that they all work. But we want to make sure your understanding of the strategies makes sense. Okay, guys, you with me? Yes? Yeah. Yeah. You guys aren't too tired after your baguettes and beninis and bellinis and whatever? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you with me? You here, yeah? You're present. Yeah. Okay, nice. Good. All right, cool, guys. So as you can see, you know, there's many, many clients, right? Zaf like, is selling a lease option portfolio, right? He's selling that. I think it's fee on it. What was it? Eight, nine, ten, something? So around about five figure fee, ten grand or whatever it is. So that works, right? We've got assisted sales. They work as well. A lot of people still might not understand the process of assisted sales. So I just want to see raise a hand so we can get a focus here. And um, me and Sam, what we're going to do is we're going to break down the strategy, but really talk about how to close the deals over the phone, right? The process. So you know exactly like one liners, your pitch, how to really get it closed. Because you can t there's a difference between talking to sellers and closing. Closing is where you get a deal done. There's a certain energy about closing you have to master. Right? It's not, it's a mastery. Closing, you have to close in every area of your life. If you don't close, you can never get a deal done. So you must know the mechanics. I want to dive a little bit deeper and then, and then intertwine that with the strategy and again, get some deep focus work here. Okay? So raise your hands. Who really understands each side from the buyer's side, the step by step process of, say, your assisted sales? Raise your hands. Okay, cool. So we're focused on that. Below market value deals. Who understands that process? All right, raise your hands. Who doesn't understand BMV? The, the, just the last bit on the, the um, on tapping, I guess, going through to solicitors. That's the bit that okay. I understand. We can, yeah, not a problem. We can break. We can. What we can do is we can break down the timeline of the difference between, say, you have an investor that goes, "Hey, I want this deal," and a retail buyer, which is an assisted sale, right? So I'll make sure you understand that. And it's really important about following the deal from A to Z, knowing each step and nurturing that deal to completion because it's not a deal until you get the money in the bank. So there's certain elements you've got to make sure you do. Okay, so lease options. Raise your hands who understands them. Raise your hands who doesn't understand them, both short term and long term. Sourcing to a tenant buyer and um, flipping to an investor or keeping it. Raise your hands who doesn't understand. No. Yeah, 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 no, for sure. I, I think that's more on. Yeah, I think everyone would be honest and say they don't understand it properly. If you'd be doing them otherwise. Like lease options, when you get them, they're very creative deals. And like I said, guys, you can either build your portfolio with them, you can source them, you can double dip them. So I want to talk about really why a seller would want to do it and how to really get them closed, how to help them and get them to realize that this is helpful for them. So for example, if what I do, right, as well, training, teaching people, mentoring, people are like, but why would I do that? I've got to get people to realize, look, here's how powerful it is to invest in yourself and get into property. But obviously people like, even though it's good for them, they're like, but, but, so you've got to learn how to handle their objections and then close them because it's for their benefit, right? You need to do that with sellers. So you really need to understand the psychology because who sort of struggled with that or had conversations with themselves about, but why would a seller want to do this and second guess it, who's had that? Why would they want to do a BMV deal? Why would they want to do a lease option? I don't understand, right? I know Sandra, you reached out about that question, but did it click more? Yeah, because yeah. we're in, this is every business, we are in the business to solve problems. We're looking for problems. I'm searching for a problem to help them add value, and that's how you get paid. So if you can solve a big problem, for example, a multi-million pound deal, which there's not tons of buyers, and you can get a buyer, you get paid in direct proportion to the value you bring to the table, right? So let's start off with lease options. What is a big thing you don't get about lease options, guys? Is there any things in your mind? Don't use that one. 
Is there any things in your mind where you don't um, get it? It doesn't resonate with you when it comes to lease options. Is there anything we thought, I just can't understand that part? Uh, the sandwich deal bit. Sandwich deal? Yeah. Is that you keeping it? I'm just, I don't know. <laughs> Or, and that, that's what, that's, what do you that, mean the sandwich? Yeah. So I, I understand the, the keeping it long term. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but what about when you're putting in a tenant buyer? Yes. And what, what's the difference between that and, and the sandwich deal? Or is that all part of the same thing? I think you mean double dip. Because that's it's the it. Same as sandwich. So yeah. the sandwich deal, like I said, with lease options. That's what I mean. I'm a bit confused yes. with the terms you, and where yes. they, they fit into what we're. Yeah. Well, you can either flip, if there's a long-term lease option where there's cash flow in the deal, yeah. you can either flip it or keep it. So if you keep it, that's a sandwich deal where you're going to put a tenant buyer in there. Okay. So, um, or what you could do is you could go, actually, let me just flip this deal as it is to an investor for a fee. That's your quickest payday. That's what Zaf's doing right now. So what he did is he found a co-sourcer that had a load of lease options but didn't have any buyers, and he introduced the portfolio. He introduced a buyer and he is getting paid a five-figure fee. And it's the quickest exit, that's the, the, Correct. the key point. That's what you got to write down. With, when you've got lease options, you've got exit strategies. This is so important to understand because when you're talking to a seller, if you don't know what the heck you're doing, they will sense it. It doesn't matter what you say, it's do you believe what you say? That's how you close. If you don't believe in what you're saying, no one, like would you ever do business if I didn't believe you could do deals, guys? You wouldn't have signed up, would you? Why the heck would you sign up, right? Come on, you, it's like, of course I believe it. And we got proof to do it. So exactly the same, because a lot of you guys subconsciously would be like, Who would, why would they want to do a lease option though? Do you know what I mean? That's almost doubt in your service. So you can't doubt your service. You've got to really get into it and go, actually, I'm, well, I'm helping someone. And what are you really doing? What problem are you solving when it comes to a lease option, guys? Can you tell me? They don't want to be a landlord. Yeah. And what does that cause emotionally for them? Thinking owner. about being a landlord, stress. No more phone calls about fixing broken. Yeah. Hassle. Whatever. Hassle, exactly. So all these things you use when you're speaking to the seller. Guys, all these things you use when you're talking to the seller. No more hassle, no more worrying about taps leaking. No more worrying about being a landlord. The, the one-liner that I always use is... Write these down, guys, the one-liners. Because it's I, I learned this was powerful and it seems to the vendors seem to buy into it, is it allows you to step away from the financial liability of your property quickly. And that's essentially what a lease option is, or you never call it a lease option when you're speaking to the clients, because they don't... What do you call it, Sam? Delay when, when they ask you, hey, oh, okay, I, I, Sam, what is this? What, so you I call just call it, it a delay... Well, it's, it's my delayed completion solution. Yeah. Delayed completion, because that's... You've always got to kind of think of it in trying to keep it in layman's terms, nice and simple. What's the ex kiss? Keep it simple, stupid. No, keep, yeah, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, I, I never get it. Don't say. ask me, man. I get it wrong um, all the time. And it's true. You should, I always say this, when you're learning and fine-tuning your pitches, it sh you should always be thinking, can I make this more simple yep. to, to Mr. and Mrs. Vendor? Because they don't get the terminology that we talk about, like BMV yep. and all this sort of stuff. So I always call it delayed completion because that's exactly what a lease option is. Um, yeah, and the one liner that that hits the nail for most in most instances is the general motivation for somebody that's seeing a negative equity is they want to get away from that problem, and it's normally financial in some capacity. It isn't always, but every single time though, it's still worth saying that uh, this solution allows you to step away from the financial liability of the property and quickly, because a lease option can be wrapped up legally in. Four weeks. Four weeks, three to four weeks, tops, Yeah. five weeks, Yeah. depending where you go in. That's quicker than in most conveyancing situations. Cash purchases, I know everyone put, makes this thing about, oh, it's going to be done in a week or two. It, it very, very rarely does get done in a week or two. Most B&V companies don't work to one, one or two <laughs> weeks, that's for sure. So um, that's the, that one liner kind of hits the spot twice. It's all about speed, and it's a, obviously about yes. letting them step away from... The, the financial yeah, that's what they want. They want their problem solved quickly. So you can speak to them and go, Look, I know you want your problem solved quickly and you probably get a lot of time wasters, right? Because in their mind, they're thinking you're a time waster. So if you can now be on their side, you're not the time waster now. You probably get that a lot, right? They also, another thing that, that is closely connected to this, this point is vendors have never heard of this solution. 
So the amount of times I've heard, oh, it sounds too good to be true, something along those lines. Um, that's another almost objection because yeah. no one's heard yeah. of lease options from a normal Joe vendor situation. If you were to have 100 people in here that are homeowners and said, you know what a lease option is, no one would know. That's for sure. Many people in the property industry don't know the ins and outs of, oh, of course, lease options yeah. properly either, do they? So they don't have a clue, yeah. Let alone, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Jones in suburbia. Um, exactly, guys. Like, you've got to understand, you've got to keep things simple. Yeah. Keep things dead, dead simple. And really, like, the way I would approach, you know, lease options in general is, again, it's going to work for someone really that has negative equity or little equity in the house. They don't have much equity in the property. That's their problem because <laughs> when they think of that, they think they can't sell it, so there are other options to rent it. But I said, why rent it to someone that wants to call you every time the tap leaks and it's causing stress? You've got management fees, and they're like, oh, God, all this. Because here's the thing with sales as well is there has to be some pain that people want solving. There has to be some pain, otherwise they wouldn't be speaking to you. That's why a lot of, that's why it's a numbers game. We talk about this. A lot of people, they go, no, it's not for me, because they don't have a problem, right? For example, when I was young, I had acne. I was looking for every solution, and I was willing to pay, because I had a problem that needed solving emotionally, right? So that's how you need to think about it in your own buying decisions. Anything you've bought in the past where you really wanted it, you've got to, you've got to think about it. How did I get closed? Because a good closer is someone that gets closed. I love buying things. I've paid, I'm paying like 50, 60 grand for masterminds because I had a problem that needed solving and I knew it could get done with speed with these guys. That's how they're thinking of you. So you need to make sure you come across like that. Instead of them, you're trying to beg them to do business with you. You can't beg, you should never be begging people to do business with you. They either want to do business with you or they don't. And if you get into that mind, mind frame, what's going to happen is they're going to be like, Hang on a minute, this person's offering me a solution, but they don't need me. Does that make sense, guys? Uh, what do you think, Sam, about that? It's not coming from like, a, it's like take it or leave it. You know, it's like, here's how we can help you. But if you, if you can say no, I say to them, very powerful one-liner as well, is look, Mr. Seller, look, James, I completely understand where you're coming from. Look, I know you don't have any equity. We've worked with many people in a similar situation. We think this might be a fit for you. And what do you think? Because I really think this is something that I, when I, this clicked with me, everything changed. You can't get someone to say yes. They've got to say, yes, I want to do this. It's got to be their decision. Does that make sense, guys? Look at the subtle differences. Forcing them to do it or getting them to say, actually, yeah, I think that strategy would work for me. They close themselves. Does that make sense, guys? Yes? So it's not like, oh, really? Uh, you know, I've had some clients at a seminar. It's like, really? I'm like, don't join. <laughs> don't, don't join the program. You don't have to join. But, you know, you can you convince, convince me of this. I'm like, just leave it. It's not for you. And then there's some people like, awesome, let's do it. Right? This, this comes back to the Same point thing. about it's a, it's a mindset. the vendor being motivated in the first place, yes. doesn't it? Yep. And this is what a lot of people struggle with when, when they start sourcing is you, you, you're, you're speaking to your, no, I'll rephrase that. You're trying to find the minority. You're not. You have to deal with the majority, yeah, yes. but you're actually trying to deal with the minority, aren't you? That's the, the key thing. And you have to. Once you've spoken to lots of leads, you very quickly uh, realise you, you want to cut to the chase to try and work out what the opportunity is. And if somebody's in negative equity, you're straight away thinking lease option. Okay, I need to get to the bottom of what the rent is versus the mortgage, where their equity level is versus the value, all these sort of things. Well, that's Quickly powerful if you write that down, actually, that knowing it's a little details, isn't it? Knowing if there's cash flow in the deal, really with a lease option, it's yeah. really identifying what's their mortgage payment. And, you know, do you need that straight away? No, you don't have to get all them details because it's a little bit much, right? Getting everything, like what's your mortgage payments as well? It's almost like you get them to tell you. Here's the thing about closing, you probably had that, Sam, people, you won't even be speaking much and people give you their info. They're just telling you about the situation, yep. and you're just listening. Yeah, yeah. We well, want to listen. That's, that's key sales. That to be listening, just because you want them to be giving you the information. And then, as you, as you, when you're on the phone, you'll be thinking, okay, I need to get to the bottom of what's the mortgage because the mortgage versus the rent is the cash flow. Whatever yes. No, for mean. sure. No, definitely, guys. Like it's really, a, it's really. Again, following the rule, the 80-20, speaking 20% and listening 80%, just asking questions and Shall listening. I just, I, I, I just 
do a quick calc on here just so people, I know there'll be a few people in the room that don't still get the term cash flow. So let's just give an example here. So say the uh, mortgage is 200, interest only, let's say, and then the rent say 500, then the cash flow, i.e. the profit before costs, is the 300. Yeah. And the value of a lease option goes up yeah. depending on how much it's cash flowing before costs. Most people, investors, look to break even 18 <coughs> months, two years on their fee compared to the monthly gross. So if it's 300 pound a month, what's that, 3,600 a year, right? So a 300 pound cash flow and lease option before any other element of it is gonna be selling for easily five grand. Yeah. Easily. Yeah. And if you, if you have buyers that say, I won't buy it for five, wait out and you will have buyers that buy it for five. Definitely. Especially, you know, with the investor portal my developers are doing and stuff, there's going to be so much people looking for these types of deals. Like, you're not going to have a problem, really, guys, selling lease options, honestly. Uh, and then just going, just still talking about this 300, because it's important for everyone to get their heads around. So why would an investor buy a lease option? And this is why they're so saleable, is because basically you, most buy-to-lets don't make 300 pounds. If you had like a vanilla buy-to-let, like a normal buy-to-let, very few, from, certainly from my experience, clear £300 um, in, in most instances anyhow. Um, the, but the great thing with a lease option is, is if it's making £300, let's say net profit before costs, and, the, and it's only cost the investor five grand, it's a real low entry point in terms of putting money in. Let's say a, a normal buy to let is, let's just randomly, let's say either it's a hundred grand property, they need to put 25 grand uh, deposit into the deal, so 75% loan to value that would be typically for a buy to let. So somebody's having to put 25 grand in to make, let's call it 200 quid on like a lot of vanilla buy to lets, just normal buy to lets make. That's great. Or you can buy a lease option um, that's five grand, so you've saved yourself 20 grand before you, before you cost, and it's making more money than normal buy to let. And this is why lease options from a investor's perspective. You could put five yeah. grand and get three and a half grand back a year back. And that's no. that's it's before mental return. And that, that that's just just off these numbers. So you, we haven't even discussed the equity side of things and what you potentially make yeah, on exactly. that. So like that's that's the power of lease options and even objections from buyers but equity, <coughs> you go, look, that's what Joe McCall said, this is hilarious actually. You can't eat equities. You can <laughs> eat cash flow, right? You can say all about cash flow. And that's what investors think about. That's all they that's all they freaking care about. So if you can break down the ROI, you can say, look, here's the ROI. Here's how it works. Here's how we can help you. We can package it up. We do all the work for you. You just got to find the tenant. You basically set to buy to let property without you going through what Sam just said. And then they go, well, what are the risks? Well, you go, look, the options are very strong. You've got many exit strategies. You can sell it on the open market by assignment. You can give it back as long as it's in the same condition, which you want to be ethical, obviously, and follow you know, it's under contract. And number three, you could put a tenant in there that wants to buy it. Right? So there's many ways to do it. We had quite a few people in the group, and the vet, maybe you'll see them in Spain, Marbella. Um, they find financial freedom through tenant buyers in four months of joining. That's where they find financial freedom. So it depends on what your exit strategies are. It's like, do I want to keep this and tenant buyer it? And we'll talk about the marketing for buyers shortly. Or do I want to package it up? You always will be able to sell a lease option deal. But like I said, Sam, so pointing out great about cash flow is identifying is this deal weak cash flow or is it strong cash flow? If it's weak cash flow, for example, some of you guys have seen that deals like that, 50 quid. I have sold deals like that, but here's the thing, like it, the longer the option as well, like I know Sam, you said like minimum of 10 years you've got deals for, right? That is yeah. more beneficial because hey, 10 years of cash flow is great and equity growth, but to make the sweet in the deal, place a tenant buyer in there that's gonna have a, you're gonna increase the cash flow. So you charge them a super rent. So you've got a decision now. You're like, okay, this deal sucks. It's hundred pounds cash flow. How do I increase it? Well, let me increase it by hundred pounds to a tenant buyer. So I've got 200 pounds cash flow now. You've got a choice. Do I, do I flip it on and double dip the deal? Which you can do. I think Volta's doing a lot of them deals now. We'll catch up about what he's doing. But I think he's doing a lot of double dips. So you find a tenant buyer, you get the fee from the tenant buyer. I know you did one with Matt, wasn't it? Yep. Um, and then you flip that deal to an investor. So you find a tenant buyer, you take their fee, three grand, and you flip it to an investor for say four, you've now got a seven or eight grand fee. 
So most investors, most guys outside this group, they look at a lease option and go, no deal. It was only £60 cash flow. It's not going to work. Uh, OK, well, OK, it doesn't work for you. We look at solutions. That's how my mind looks. How can I make a solution to this problem? Oh, a tenant buyer will pay an extra 100 to 150 pounds in cash flow. A vet's got a deal, their own properties, they're paying an extra 250 pounds on top of the market rent. And I'll talk about that. We can break down, because I know a lot of people have questions about this. How does it work? Mm. And I really want you to get this, because you can make some great income from lease options. And again, the opportunity is going to be big. And if there is a dip in the market in the next three, four years, two years, whenever it's going to happen, lease options are going to be wildly available. So, so it's really... So what happens if uh, you stay in the middle, yeah. yeah, you've got a tenant buyer in there, and it doesn't make its money? Let's say the property, um, you've, you've agreed it's going to be worth 100 in 10 years' time, Yeah, yeah, but it's actually only, only still worth 90. So if it's, so for example, if you had it, so you've you got a tenant buyer in there, right? So you've got a tenant buyer in there. They're going to buy it, for, normally, let's just say you've got this with the seller, a hundred, you do a five year deal and you do it for the tenant buyer normally for 110. So you're expected to make say 10 grand, right, on the back end, but this has gone down to 90. Um, the tenant buyer, obviously, what happens to them is, you know, obviously the old saying goes, shit happens, right? <laughs> we didn't see it. No one knew there was going to be a recession here. Yeah. So we can, what we can do is we can increase their option. We can basically, because here's the really important thing that you've got to get if you're keeping the deals, is if you've got this, we do A and B, right? That's you and the seller. You've agreed a 10-year option with the seller, right? Yeah. You've now said to the tenant buyer, hey, you can buy this deal, buy us out of this deal for 110, but it's five years. So that gives you five years wiggle room. So what you do is you basically say, look, um, we didn't see this happen. Do you still want to buy the house? Yeah, I love the house. Well, let's increase it by two to three years, let the market recover. And of course, they're happy to do that. They just need to wait two or three years to qualify for a Barclays mortgage or NatWest. But for that, uh, the, the owner needs to have a mortgage that is long enough? Yeah, it's correct, yeah. So if you ever do a 10-year deal, you want to make sure that there's a long enough mortgage. If it's obviously like tiny, then yeah, you want to do a shorter deal. I know that interest on me is ideal for the mortgage. Yep. What's the solution on the other part? Is there anything you can do on the other part? Uh, just if it's free payment, then if there's no cash flow, never get be advising them to change their mortgages. I wouldn't go down that route. If pers advise them to a mortgage broker, but don't give them that advice because it's not good. I think you can't really do that. What you want to do is you want to make sure that you look for a tenant buyer. So let's just say this deal, 500 quid rent, and it's £400 uh, mortgage. So as £100 cash flow, really you want £200 cash flow. So you say to the tenant buyer, the rent is going to be 600 Why would they pay more? Because it's a premium. Where can you get rent to own on the market? If, you, if you've got, uh, you just had a, a kid or whatever, and you want to settle down, they're going to nursery, you don't want to be, have, be in a rented accommodation because you have that uncertainty. So rent to own gives them a certainty that they can do up the house, they're allowed to make improvements, and it's in their mentality, it allows them to go, hang on a minute, I've got the option to buy this house at a certain price. So if they ever ask, sometimes they just don't ask, if they go, well, I'm paying more, what you can do is you can say, the hundred pounds extra you're paying we can take, say, 50 quid of that as a rent credit. Does that make sense? Who understands that or not? So essentially, for example, let's just say this is what a lot of people, this has been, I learned this from America, it works in the UK, it's fantastic. A lot of people were teaching it wrong, saying you've got to hold it in deposits. That's my dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. And this is going on YouTube, by the way. Uh, that's dumb. Whoever's teaching that stuff, that's just ludicrous. I mean, you shouldn't be keeping, it makes no sense. It's so complicated. What you do is you do a rental credit. So let's just say the option is, you can see why they like me, yeah? <laughs> let's say the option is 100, uh, 110 grand, sorry for them, right? And you agree in the contract that 50 quid of their monthly rent comes off, credits off of this. 
So let's just say they buy it in two years. That is 1,200, right? So 1,200 pounds gets knocked off this when they go to exercise their option. So it's not dead rent. They've got some credit coming off, but they had to pay a surplus. I try and not do that if I'd only get an increase in cash flow from the tenant buyer if your existing deal is struggling for cash flow. Does that make sense, guys? Yes? So don't complicate it where it doesn't need to be. If it's 200 quid, keep it at 200 quid. They pay market rent. However, if you've got to find a tenant buyer and just increase the rent, do it. Because trust me, like people will pay for the value they get. People will pay for the value they get, right? You guys are here in one-to-one. -one. You paid more because it's more value rather than group or, or an online product. Because it's more value. It's the same thing as this. So don't think, why would they pay more? Because it's a premium. The other thing just to note yeah. now is rent to buy works really well for uh, self-employed or recent self-employed. Yes. Yeah. And the, yeah. the culture of self-employment is probably the highest it's ever been at the moment. So it gives them the period to get books together because a lot of the high street lenders will want you to have uh, a certain amount of books, certainly to get the best products anyhow. True. Um, and that gives a, the opportunity for, for people to kind of get the books together, uh, maybe correct any bad credit they've had before. Um, and then with a view of purchasing the property at the end of the term, basically. Yeah, I'll just write this down. It's ben it benefits the self-employed. Again, bad credit or no credit. Obviously, if you have no credit, you can't get a mortgage nowadays, can you? Um, and new to the UK. Yeah, I was just going to say that. Yeah, it's got, not... You have to build a credit. Yeah. Where, where does it stand legally with um, a standard seller, not a, not a landlord, so they've got a normal mortgage in place. Most have got the no subletting clauses in mortgages, yes. haven't they? Where does it stand with that? Well, most... most uh, the majority will, majority of lease options, from my experience, come from a landlord or landlady any house. There's no issue because on a buy to yeah. let. It's like accidental, isn't it? They, like, if, they try to rent. If they've got, it, uh, if they, if it's coming from like a, what you'd call a normal residential position, the option is for the solicitors to sort out consent to let. Um, that would be the normal route. And from my experience, again, that's always been signed off um, with the clients I've dealt with. But. There's a lot of vendors that will just leave it on residential, and that's you have to ask yourself. Well, that's that, that's well, it. You, here's the worst case scenario: they will go, they just pat on the wrist or give you an admin fee charge. Like, it's, it's it's one of them things. Like at the end of the day, but you oh, can get consent. You can get consent to that. What do you think you get? Yeah, they put the interest rate up, but I've had people do it before, and it was that they just said, I've had clients do it. But obviously, it's not advised to do it. Yeah. Yeah, that can happen, yeah. But obviously, you don't want to go, you want to be honest, you want to get consent to let. Yeah, that's what we've been doing with the ones that we've got. Yes. Yeah. 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 You want to get consent to that. It's going to be a bit like the thing is, it's just getting through to someone or getting the solicitor to do that. But you can get consent to let. The reason why is because let's just say they're selling a house, and what is it going to be the options to get repossessed? The house to get repossessed because they have no equity in it because they bought in the recession, which has happened to loads of people, or they can let the property out because they're moving on with their life. So they will, it's just one of them things you just get through to them and getting through to the right people. Um, but that comes when it comes, you know. But again, it's not like you can't get consent to let. You can always get it. It's either going to be an admin fee at the back end of the mortgage or whatever the deal is, right? Um, it's all negotiable because remember, banks don't, what's the other option? So, okay, is the seller going to get repossessed? They don't want to repossess a property. So they will give consent to let, but banks like money. <laughs> so it's knowing what the deal is, where, yeah. So it's basically dealing with it when it happens. But that's why we're here to help you with that. But normally what I've found is a lot of them have tried to rent before or whatever. Sometimes I just get the seller to get consent to let and they get it straight away with different terms. So it just depends. Um, so yeah, a tenant buyer, again, is these normally these three things here. Self-employed, their credit, or new to the UK. 
And if you want to keep the deals, I recommend you flip the deals first. You just get into, you flip some deals and you get into that process of flipping the lease options. Yeah, I'd agree because if you've, you know we were talking about being um, suffering from overwhelm. I think the quickest way that you get your head around it is by just trading a couple of lease options because then you see the process from basically from start to finish. So the point from you get the lead from wherever that's come from to the point you're being paid, that sort of A to B is where you really learn the, what I would call the delicacies of a lease option, isn't it? Rent to buy is more complicated than tenant buyer deals, whatever. And I agree, you should kind of move into those. If you do just a couple of lease options, just straight normal lease options, your, your, everything will just come together. It'll be like, oh, right, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, because now it's like, okay, I need to act. Is that old consent to that I need it? Then you just do it rather than theory. Theory, have thinking about it is what keeps people broke as fuck. They say broke. The people that think, like, it's like, what happens about that? It's like, and then there's someone, there's, there's people like this, and there's people like, boom. So what Dan Payne said is, goes, most people in life have their emergency brakes on. When you let go of your emergency brakes, you move forward. Oh, I've done, like, okay, there's a guy called Joe. He's a surname because I've not got content for his testimonial, but anyway, he come to my event in Spain. I think it was the one you were at, Sam, um, with my buddy Garrett. Garrett. Uh, he done over 50 deals in Ireland in a year, exchange and delay completions, lease options, 50 in a year. Added 10 grand cash flow a month to his thing, 50 from Facebook. And we asked him, so what do you do? He goes, I didn't know. I don't even know what I'm doing, but I just do it. He did, the guy takes massive action and figures it out later. He done 50 deals, like genuine. And we've seen, like Sam, I know people don't see it until you see it, but we've seen guys do 18 deals in a few months, haven't we, in the group you're a part of. <coughs> We've seen that before. 18 deals, like, but, uh, it's cool, even no million pound deals. I'm like, even the, I'm just like, cool, that's great. It doesn't, I'm not, it doesn't really, it's amazing, but it's not like I've seen it before, it becomes normal. So lease options, I've done so much of them. This is what allowed me to quit my job, by flipping them. They are so easy to find investors for, it's, they're so, they're so yeah, they, they're so, there's so much benefits, what John was saying earlier, the ROI, this, they've been around for so long, no one understands them because they don't, again, it's not their speciality. But again, these are much better than rent to rents. Oh yeah, definitely. Like in terms of a lease option. Yeah, because well, you, you're, they're so much better because you've got the, the, the purchase option element, so you, there's equity to be made. Like that, what was the one we, that we were talking about? Oh, I can't remember what it was, Halifax. And we, I went back and looked at the numbers and that um, Max bought it off me. Yeah. He made like 30 grand equity in it's two and, two and, a, half and a bit years. That's like... Should have kept that one, man. <laughs> Should have kept that one. <laughs> but you flipped it for like seven, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. I, I, well, I yeah. traded it on for like seven grand. So, yep. so if we come down to the objections, because no one here would be worried about the strategy if the seller just went, okay, let's do it, right? Mm -hmm. So what objections have you had that you're struggling with or any objections come to mind guys and me and Sam can help you and we can give you some one-liners and again when you go back over the recording and listen to this you should always just go back and go okay that's where I'm focusing right I'm gonna go back and master it because when I get on the phone to the lease option I sound like a parrot I'm saying the same and <laughs> actually squawk but I say the same things over and over again because there's a pattern to human psychology, their objections, the way they think. There's a pattern. It's like, if, you, if we'd done it now, right, Sam, it'd be, you know what's coming up. You know what objection's going to come, and you know how to handle it, because you know how to close. Well, so what it's, objections? It's just, well, it's just because you, like I always say, by the time you've made 10 calls for, like, negative equity clients, you yeah. soon realise it's the same patterns, yeah. the same questions. Yeah. Da, 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 da. So practice, what objections you got, guys? Objections that you've had when you're talking to sellers? For lease options. The mortgage is still in my name. Mortgage still in your yeah, correct. That's what I would say. When they go the mortgage is in my name, I go exactly. We keep it in your name because obviously, you know, we want to make sure you still have that element of control. But under contract, we're going to be responsible for all the maintenance. We essentially become the landlords, so you don't have to worry about all that hassle. And I always ask this back because this is key, guys. You should never answer an objection with a question because they've got control of the conversation. If they go, hey, 
well, what about this mortgage is still in my name? And you go, well, you know, you know these are the benefits. And now they're going to go, well, who are you? What's your company again? So have you got any testimonials? Have they got control of the conversation. You should acknowledge. Here's the thing of object, objections, guys. Three steps. Acknowledge and then relax. So don't blur a load and go, yeah. <laughs> Listen and then go, good question. And then you, you sort of tell a little story and then you ask him a question. You don't mind if we make money long term when we sell the property, do you? Because that's why we're doing it. So why the heck wouldn't you pay their mortgage if that's where you make your money when you sell the house at the end? So when they say yes, in closing, they talk about like small commitments. You've had that sound, right? It's like they go, yeah, OK, all right, great. We're going to get over heads of time. Can you send that back? Yeah. Reply to our email, yes. When you keep asking these questions and they say yes, and they get them small mini commitments, they're much more likely to say yes and close and sign your heads of terms because you've taken them down a timeline of saying yes, yes, yes. It's called mini commitments. Otherwise, if they're telling you everything and treating you, throwing you around like this, well, you do this. I just say, gone. I, you, you should do this, guys. If there's a seller treating you like crap, just put the phone down. Yeah, for sure. Just put the phone down. You don't That's need to deal with that. No, you know? definitely. I've had that. I'm like, literally, it's like, yeah, yeah. I'm just like, beep. I've had that with some clients and want to join Kesha. Like, yeah, beep. Bye. I, I could... <laughs> See ya. I don't it's, need you. I it's so true, anyone. though, because like, if, if you think, if they're being knobheads, <laughs> on the phone to you. Uh, I, how are you? How are and that, that you gives you confidence, guys, because yeah. you've got control. That's what Grant Cardone talks about. You want control. You don't want to feel like, oh man, like these sellers are treating me like crap. You yeah, don't, yeah. never want to feel like that. That's, like, that's what you're getting out of your job, right? Because you've got people telling you and dictating everything you do. You don't want that. If you want to have the element of control. In what totally. You're doing. And if, if, they're, if they're hard work just when you're trying to talk, offer a solution. I would be off the phone just straight away, basically, to Tom's point, because if you can't even deal with somebody, you've kind of got to look at it as a joint venture. You're, you're acting on the vendor's behalf. It is kind of, it is a joint venture, essentially, because you, you've got to have a good, what I'd call, working relationship, because if you haven't, it's never going to happen. It's never going to get through legals. You're never going to trade it on or keep it for yourself. It's going to be a minefield. So if, the, if you're on the phone to somebody that is being a, a dick, basically, just... Yeah. Get go on to there. the next lead. Yeah, go. Be this willing isn't for me. to walk Stay away, later. guys. Yeah. The strongest negotiation negotiating position is the person that is willing to walk away. If you're willing to walk away, people naturally gravitate towards that. There's something I don't know. It's in human psychology. Someone that doesn't need that person. <laughs> you can tell, right? If you ever gone to a seminar and there's a guy selling and they really need you to join, you're like, oh man, this is just. Yeah. They they look great. They say everything great, but it's like, nah, I don't want to join. There's some. But they just don't care, do you know what I mean? And then it's naturally more attractive, it's more honest. Do that. With sales, you don't need to be perfect <coughs> over the phone. You just need to be honest in how you feel. And when you get past that, it's so freeing. You're now free because you, you don't care. Does that make sense, guys? You've got to be willing to walk away. Mark had a question. Uh, when yeah. seller asks, how do they bid a person with giving like they want to upfront fee or something like that, I've heard that before. Yeah, how do you handle that one time if someone goes with an upfront fee? I've only ever had it once and I paid a fee because they had like, they were in arrears to the tune of like three grand and I cleared that because I wanted to keep the lease option myself. That's the only time I've ever done it. I, I, my objection, my, sorry, my response back to that objection would be yeah. we don't pay fees uh, uh, up front because we're already paying for your legals, our legals. Um, we wouldn't typically pay a fee for this solution. We, we aren't going to make any profit till much further down the line. And by then, you've normally explained how a delayed completion works. And I've never had anybody that yeah. has kind of insisted on that. Sometimes you'll get people that ask it that, for example, if they have lots of equity, then probably. So try and if they, let's just say they've got 10, 20, 30 grand equity, legit equity, yeah. try and get them on a short term option and just source them a tenant buyer. So like a, a two year deal and just find them a tenant buyer. And then maybe oh, we had a couple that did really well, 2016, Phil and Karen. They'd done about nine deals in the year just from Gumtree. Yeah. And the way they were doing these deals is they were sourcing tenant buyers. I call this like a short-term lease option. Basically just finding them a tenant buyer. They would pay full market value rent, but they had some equity sometimes, but it was like a two-year deal. And they gave them 30, 40% of their option fee. 
So they incentivize a deal and actually gave them some money. So some will push their luck. I don't like to mention a number. I say, well, what would work for you? You know? I, I would say just be pragmatic about it. Yeah. So that's not that I wouldn't do it. But in an ideal sense, you don't want to be paying up front. Especially fees, if the they don't have any equity in the deal. No, but, if they, but let's say it's a, a really good deal for, say, equity, yes. location, cash flow. Yeah. And it meant that you had to chuck a couple of grand at it to make the deal kind of work. And it was a great deal. Then it's obviously a bit of a no-brainer. And you can factor that in. Even if you weren't keeping it yourself, let's say it was a really good lease option. And you were selling it on for seven grand and you had to pay the vendor two. You're still netting five anyhow. So to make the deal work and then get 5k then that's good business isn't it basically that portfolio of zaps the other day had a thousand pound per deal uh, per lease kickback on them but there was a four and a half five grand fee in each one so yeah you know well, he, he put a bit on himself on that the vendor did i know there was a little bit, bit, bit less i know i've recommended it and put more on <laughs> yeah, it's exactly like, yeah, it, as long as it works for both parties. Sometimes yeah. sellers will go, I need some. And I go, well, if we can do this deal for us to move forward today, what would you like to see happen next? That's one of the best closing questions. Get them to agree to the close. What happens in closing is you speak, there's an awkward silence, and then they're like, uh, what happens next? You go, what would you like to see happen next? Probably sounds familiar when you're speaking to me, right? <laughs> you spoke to me. But seriously, what, it's, it's very it's simple. There's no tricks, no bullshit. You're not looking to manipulate people, guys. You've got to ethically persuade people because, come on, does the lease option solve a problem? If they had to rent it out and they had, and they had tenants that were trashing the house, that's going to cost them a lot of money. Voids, management fees, hassle. For a guy or a girl that knows nothing about property, that is hassle. It's a lot of hassle for the average person, right? Think of someone in your family, like your parents or someone you know that is really like anti-business, them dealing with a few properties to rent to tenants, right? They wouldn't know what they were doing. They would go, look, management company, look after it, please. And they wouldn't have a clue. So you want to handle that objection and go, look, you don't want to hand it to a management company that promises the world. You still got to look after voids. <coughs> there still will be management fees, 10%. And there still will be possibly, hopefully not, tenants that trash the place. <coughs> it happens. But... We can guarantee that under contract, we can move forward and give you the price you want so you can move on. Here's some benefits as well. If it's a repayment mortgage, they are actually benefiting from you <coughs> taking control of the house and paying down their repayment mortgage. So let's just say you've agreed it for <coughs> 100 grand and the mortgage is 100 grand, but principal, I don't know, whatever, I don't know what it would be, 150 comes off a month or whatever, 100 quid comes off a month. If you control that property for five years, whatever it's. Six, 25, grand. 25 grand off, yeah? Is it? Mm. Six grand. Six grand, yeah, I was going to yeah, say 25. Grand. So, okay, yeah, six grand. So, I was going to say. So, now they had no money in the house. So, listen, guys, they had zero cash in the house. It was a burden. They hated it. They, they didn't want to think about tenants. In five years, if just 100 pounds of the principal comes off, right? Or 100 pounds of the monthly payment comes off. They've now got a six grand payday. So you talk about that because most people don't understand it. They just see that there's no cash in the house. Does that make sense, guys? Yes? So there's lots of benefits to it. Does it make sense? About one and a half person said yes. Does it not make sense? Yes. Yeah. So ask questions. What does it make sense, Georgie? Are there? Uh, I, just, I, I just wasn't sure about how, how they got that 6K yet. Was that like... Yeah, so for example, let's just say you exercise the deal. You exercise the deal. The mortgage, obviously, for your option, right, was 100 grand to buy. Let's just say you ended, uh, the tenant buyer bought it off you, right? They bought it off you for 110. That's your, uh, the option for the seller was 100 grand. Make sense? You get the 10 grand. So you, you net 10K. But... The, they're going to buy it for, um, they're buying it, obviously you had the option for 100, but the mortgage that they've got to pay back, remember they, it was break even, so if they sold that house, they would have just basically had no cash. But now their mortgage has gone down to 94 grand. <coughs> they pay 94 grand back, to, just like you, sell your house now, you, you, let's just say for example your mortgage is 94, but a buyer buys it for 100, 6 grand, that's what they get. Does that make sense? So, yeah, you're essentially doing it that way. 
So how would that be initiated in option time? So the tenant buyer's got the option to buy at 110 in six years' time. Yeah. Right, they're ready to do the deal. What happens? Well, obviously, that's why you've got all the contracts. The contract's in place, Sam. You've got the management. So the power of option. draws it up at this stage. For yeah. all that to happen, like, can that yeah. be deferred? See, that power of attorney, um, what do you mean deferred in terms of like... Well, as in, like, for the deal to get, for, for the tenant buyer to complete as such. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they have the option as well. So they're at land registry, so a solicitor will be informed, right. or the power of attorney. I mean, the power of attorney is there if the seller isn't present, they're in Cambodia, the property can still be transacted. That's where the, the yeah, columns exactly can that. still be transacted. So everyone's informed. So who would actually implement the start of that? The tenant buyer, we'd contact the tenant buyer or the tenant buyer would contact us or how, how would that work in what, what Well, the tenant it? buyer would say, because they're speaking to you, so the tenant buyer can hell want to buy it. Yeah. If you're sourcing, you're out of the deal. You're gone. So you yeah. find it, flip it, forget it. Yeah. But if you're staying in the middle, the tenant buyer will inform you. Just like, let's just say you've got your own property, you own it, and one of your tenants want to buy it. <coughs> they contact you, hey, John, I want to buy this. It's exactly the same process. It goes to the solicitors. When they do that, then the solicitors get engaged and they do the technical work. And basically, the same as if I was going to buy a house for cash, they will exercise that option. Yeah. Yeah. So, would the seller not have to be involved 10 years down the line? They will get obviously instructed and contacted, but they don't have to be present. No, they could be. The power, the, the, in the lease option contract is what's called a power of attorney, and that's the element that allows uh, effectively for whoever's holding the option to go through the legal process without the permission of the, uh, the original vendors. But uh, it would normally be done that they would still be contacted, but yeah. like Tom, let's say they disappeared to Cambodia, it would all be drawn up legally beforehand yeah. so, so that it could, could still that's be That's why it's so important we talked about that the wife and husband are both on the agreement, it, it, option yeah, agreement. Yeah, it can't happen without that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. power of attorney, the option agreement, that you got the right to buy it for 100, and a management agreement which allows you to receive rent, or the buyer that's buying it. So you've got management agreement, which is basically you're responsible for the maintenance and you can receive rent. So let's just say you went to a, 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 a letting agency and they said, who the heck is this person? They're not, on the la they're not on the title of the property. Well, you've got a management agreement that says you're allowed to receive rent. And then power of attorney means the property can happen, the sale can happen if the seller yeah. is not present. And the third component is the option. Yeah. So the op yeah. Yeah, how, yeah. Much, how much that can be purchased at for whatever term. So let's... Yes, great. Yeah. Just on, sorry, I was just going to quickly add to that. The, the power of the lease option is, is the fact that it can, be, it can be skinned so it's such a flexible solution. That's what I love about lease options. Everything is, can be drawn up and be super flexible. And that, once you've got that in your arsenal in terms of uh, your property dealings, that's, that's the power of the lease option. There is so much flexibility how you set the contract up. There really, there's a kind of standard template like there always is, but then everything can be altered depending on kind of what, it's what you're the trying seller to achieve. Agrees, isn't yeah, it? It's yeah. the terms you agree. Like if the seller goes, well, actually I'd love to do a deal, but can, if it goes up in equity, can I get a split of your equity? Yeah, that can be drawn in. You can incentivize them that goes, actually, whatever we make above 100 grand, we can give you a percentage. So if it's worth 120 and you've agreed 20% with the seller, they're going to make four grand, right? of your profit, so you can incentivize them. Never underestimate the power of incentives with humans. You should research that about the power of influence of incentives. If someone's given an incentive to do something, people will do it, trust me. Well, Think of something in your life that you've had an incentive yeah. to do something and you did it, right? If you exercise, someone says you exercise for 90 days, you're gonna look like that person. That's they've, an got, they've got skin in the game, basically. That's, that's why, in that example, isn't it? They know yes. that further down the line, they're gonna be getting an extra it's like we're partners now. It's yeah, a different it's a, mindset. It, it's exactly that. It's suddenly become a joint venture, in their heads, a joint venture or, or partnership. <coughs> yeah. Especially try and keep it your standard, yeah. standard option. But if you can negotiate to get the deal done, you negotiate because you don't get what you want in life. You get what you negotiate. It's about the negotiation. It's got to be a win-win though. It has to be a win-win situation, and you've got to be really honest with the seller, guys. You've got to come from that frame. No tricks, no manipulation. Honest, but you've got to learn how to close. To make sense, you've got to learn how to take control of the conversation and really lead them down. The objections should be like this. It's like life almost. It's like this. Little objection, little dip, you've overcome it. Little dip, you've overcome it. And now you're at 
We send the heads of terms. You've got them to agree, right? They're on board of you, they trust you. Anyone that can handle objections is, is someone to be trusted. Let's just say you asked me and Sam a question on the, before you met us and we couldn't answer anything about a property. Naturally, you, you wouldn't be engaged, right? It wouldn't make sense. I wouldn't if I joined Masterminds and I said, how's that work? And they're like, I don't know. Seriously though, right? So rapport and trust and likability comes from when someone helps you. And when someone has a problem, an objection, and you help them and you, and you simplify it, you've just helped that individual out. You've served them. So now, of course they're gonna say yes. So we're gonna send over the heads of terms, simple paperwork. If you can just sign that, and then what we can do is we can do a viewing, and then we move forward to exchange. Can you do that by 7 p.m. tonight? Yes, that's fine, pardon? Yes, okay, great, we're gonna send it over in the next five minutes. Any questions, just let me know. And if they don't send it over, don't even message them. Just go on, they're not serious. Just go back, next one. The power of sending heads of terms. Like Umar, they got, they, these guys have got eight deals under control. They've only started, at, they started in the new year. Even if they don't sell four of them, they sell four more, which they will do. Like they're, all they're doing is just offers. That's all they're doing. So we're just making offers from us. That's all, I'm, that's all I'm doing. You told me to make offers, that's all I'm doing. If we listen to some of their recordings of their calls, would they be perfect? Probably not. But again, they're doing the one thing that matters, and that is really practice. That's what, we, that's what Sam says all the time, is practice. If you keep making sales calls, this is what I learned when I was learning sales, is if I keep making sales calls, I'm just gonna get better and better. And if you get good at sales, my God, your whole life gets good. Mm. Because you can, cl you can communicate. I really think that what the, we didn't get taught at school is how to communicate. And if we got taught that, my God, imagine if you could communicate so well that you could get someone, you know, ethically do something that would benefit them. People you know in your life probably now that want, you know they could change and you can't influence them in that way because you don't know how to get, but what if you could influence them? Well, they could say, actually, no, I want to change now. You can motivate them. Well, this is when you start closing, you'll be, have that ability. It's funny because you know? so, really so, sales is quite, uh, it always cracks me up this because I've been in sales the whole of my career. And it always makes me laugh how sales has got this kind of negative Dirty connotation. Word. Yeah. Dirty word, negative word. And it's like, I don't know any poor, capable salespeople, that's for sure. I know some very wealthy people, male and female, but are exceptional at sales. No edu what you call special education, and they are loaded. It's, <laughs> uh, it's, sort of, it's a skill that yeah. I agree with you. It, people underestimate how powerful being, being able to speak to people, people is. People think it's have you Did you ever get brought up with that, guys, or around that like, sales is bad? Them, you know, sleazy, the guy in suits, when you see people, maybe even subconsciously you have it, you go into a coffee shop and you see the meetings of the guys in suits, you're like, ah, oh, man, I don't like them. But again, you don't have to like everyone, but sales really, if it's done in a positive way of act actually helping someone, it's a very beautiful thing because you can close someone. If I didn't, you know, some, some of the clients that have joined that I know, all the people, for example, like, no, Sam that joined. If I couldn't, if I didn't know how to communicate my product in the best way, wouldn't have joined, wouldn't be here, wouldn't do things. You guys, you know, what I mean, you wouldn't. It would just be like crap. So you got to really monetize your leads. So there's benefits of closing. One, you need less leads. Two, you really get it. And three, you're not putting off the thing that near enough everyone does in property. Go to any network meetings and ask them how much offers do you make on a weekly basis. They'll be like, uh, what? What do you mean? Uh, what do you mean I make offers? Like, it's like, yeah, you've got to make an offer <laughs> to do a deal, you know? I, re I, I heard this actually in business. I think Frank Kern was talking about it the other day on his Facebook Live. And it really resonated with me. It goes, I can't remember who made the quote up, but I guess it's universal, is your income is in direct proportion to the amount of offers you make in your marketplace. And when I heard that, I was like, that's so simple. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, and you guys, who's starting to make offers and you get make progress, right? Yeah? Of course you do. So it's all about offers. So really, is there any things that are holding you back now, guys? Like one line is like, you just, you can't get into the state that me and Sam can really help with you now. Because obviously, let's be honest, guys, that's the million pound skill, right? Is, is the phone. Would you agree, guys? Yes? And are you guys given a hunt? Could you guys put your hand up now and go, I'm really given everything I can every day on the phone, right? So Larry is, yeah, you can say it. This year, right, you started to, okay, good, that's awesome. Uh, are you making progress? Yeah. You feel more confident over the phone? 
Yeah. So what did you do? Is there any things you did to... Because last year, you didn't feel like that, Larry, or... Like, is there anything you're doing now where you're like, is it just picking up and doing it? Is it going back over the videos or webinars or anything uh, you're doing? Um, last year, I just didn't have the time, but this year, I, I just stopped thinking about it. Just started like, calling. It. It. <laughs> That's fantastic, man. I like it. No thought, just do it. Yeah, Sums it's it up, as simple as that. You know, yeah. some of our t <laughs> teachers are probably to blame. We should just pick up, pick up the fucking phone. You know what I mean, but we, you got to understand it. Um, <coughs> Any objections you have, guys? Any things you feel str you struggle with? Like, is there any specific things in your mind you're like, I can't move forward because I don't understand that with, say, lease options? Just a little concern. What happens if any of the parties die during this period of lease options? Yeah. Do, I, I know. We mean like the seller? If the seller it holds up yeah. whoever's in the will, I guess, yeah, with yeah, the, yeah. for the property, it would go there. But your option stays. Mm. Okay. And that's handled by the contract. Any bankruptcy yeah. or death or anything like that. Okay, and if, morbid, but if I die, say in the process, then the person I'm, I've got the don't agreement. die on me, don't play. No, 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 sure. <laughs> 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 sure. Might come up, might come up. Yeah. You know, what happens if you die? What happens to my my tenant buyer? Everyone might get concerned. Just, I need yeah. to really answer a question like that. So I don't know. I mean, it wouldn't happen. If 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 you did, the the option would go if it was just you on the end. So tenant buyer would basically not be a tenant buyer anymore? Well happen? then, obviously, they could then go directly with a seller. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. What, exactly what would happen. That's what would happen, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. okay. options are very strong contracts. Like, okay. That's what developers, it, if options weren't around, there would be no skyscrapers. Mm. Yeah, There'd be it's nothing. Because exactly you know, the developer has the option, he gets planning consent, now he exercises it, because the developer couldn't go, oh, I'll buy these 20 row of houses for X amount of money, and then the People, council will say, sorry, you can't have planning permission. So that options, they've been around forever. They're yeah. very strong. But a solicitor can really, when you get one come up, they can sort of go through. But that's what would happen. Okay. So you can use it. If they do come up, you can use these objections, guys, and go, you're probably thinking. Normally, they're not. It's normally us, our property thinking hack. Because we're in this business, right? We're so geeky about it that we're going to go into every little mode. Sometimes you will get asked that question, and then you know the but answer. But from the solicitor's perspective, they obviously don't see it really from a property perspective. They're looking at it as a legal perspective. So every eventuality that you're kind of talking about and everything else that can happen, CCJs, whatever, it's all drawn into the contract because that's what the solicitor's obviously there for, basically. Any other questions regarding lease options, guys? Okay, cool. We can go when deals. It's great when you're taking action because you have a deal and then you'll be like, okay, what do I do here? And you can move forward. Um, so assisted sales. So assisted sales, again, they're really powerful, guys. We know I've seen clients do, if a clients do assisted sales, 90 grand, 90,000 euros in Ireland. If I had clients do 22 grand deals, I've had many clients do high 20,000 pound deals from assisted sales. They're very powerful. I believe they're very easy. I've got to say they're not that hard, assisted sales, guys, because they're so beneficial for the seller and they solve, they're in the middle ground where most guys, you know, they're going in and the house is worth 100. Most people are going in only 75 and it's getting rejected. And on the internet, there's many people that are like, well, I would be willing to take, I don't know, 82 or something or 85, right? But again, like the home buying companies only want to buy the house cash for 75. So there's a lot of people, there's a big opportunity out there for assisted sales. So... When it comes to assisted sales, guys, what do you not understand? Who's actually made offers, assisted sell verbal offers to sellers? Yeah. Who has, raise their hands of offers, who's made more than 20 offers from in the last month? 10? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's 20, yeah. How much have you made, Alex? Okay, who's made more than 20 in the last month? Yeah, probably not more than 20. For verbal offers. Yeah. So let's say about 10, oh, right? Over 10. Okay. We'll say eight. <laughs> um, okay, guys, so again, you need to sort the lead problem out. If who's had leads coming in but not made offers to every lead? The reason? Yeah, did you offer all three, though? Lease option, assisted sale, BNB? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You've got to offer, guys. Sellers are only on the phone for an offer. You have to make offers. But really, another question, guys. That's why we're doing the, the 28 day challenge. How is the phrase, um, 
let Sam go. So, uh, I'm just trying to think. If I would use For, an give us an example, yeah. like if they rejected the BMV, or like give us yeah, a scenario. Or just put it across the, the side. There's, there's a few ways of pitching it, depending on what the conversation is and how motivated the client is. So, your, I suppose, your optimum assisted sale is let's say you get a vendor to agree to a BMV offer. So, let's say 75, 80% of value. Um, assisted sale, you can kind of pitch it to the client that you, so if you were going just down the BMV route, you could trade that on uh, for let's say two or three grand depending on the opportunity. So assisted sales work quite well from about 100 to say 200, 250 because there's yeah. more equity in there. So why, say again, in terms of the value, yeah. It works, so there's like a sweet spot from about, I don't know, call it 120 to say 250. So the bulk of probably what business you're looking at on a day-to-day -day basis. So let's say you get a vendor to agree to a BMV offer. Why it's worth switching to an assisted sale, depending on the timescales that the vendor needs, is you can get a bigger fee on assisted sale. So classic example, let's just say you've got BMV offer, you've made an offer, it's 80% of value, and you know you could trade it on for say two or three grand, let's call it, just call it three grand. An assisted sale works that you could go back to the vendor and I would pitch it along the lines of, look, I have another solution that I wouldn't normally offer most vendors. Mm. We've got a very good rapport, so I just wanted to float it past you and see what your thoughts are. Mm. Um, as I always say, curiosity killed the cat. They'll want to know about this at this point. If, they've, if they're keen on a BMV offer, you know they've bought into you as an individual anyhow. Um, and I say, look, we, we've got another... Uh, uh, option for you where we would, you've still got the BMV offer in the background as the security blanket, is the term I always use. Um, but I've got an option where, where we aggressively market it on the open market, where effectively you've got the cash offer in the background as the security blanket, but with this solution, um, I can get you more, more money for your property. How does that sound? They're yeah. always gonna say yes, the only reason they wouldn't is if they're under really strict timescales. Yeah. So that and that's would, when a cash offer. And that's when your yeah. cash offer is the cash but offer. I think some people think, Sam, don't they? Like, even if the seller goes, no, I can't sell at 25% off, you can still then come in well, with the assisted sale. Yeah, like exactly. Routes. And there's, there's all different levels of motivation. You've got yeah. like somebody facing repo, which is as repossession, where they're as motivated as, as possible, basically. And then you've got other people that are motivated, but not under what, what I would call duress. So let's say somebody wants to, I don't know, uh, downsize to the coast, retirement. They're motivated and they want to do it, but they're not under huge time pressures. That's a classic example where you could introduce uh, an assisted sale and it would work very well for them. So at this point, if they said, OK, yeah, that sounds interesting, and they say, well, how will that work? Or you say, well, basically, uh, so you explain, obviously, the cash offer still in the background, as I've just done. You say, we'll take it to the open market. Um, we'll use professional photography so your property looks the very best it can do. Yeah. We'll price it aggressively so it gets maximum impact in the marketplace. It's on the open market for good reason, so it gets put in front of as many as the wider audience as possible. And then we'll split the we'll split the, the uh, amount achieved 50/50 above the cash offer. And then normally you would give them an example of how that potentially will work out. So. Um, and you give them the calcs, and then they're always going to earn effectively more going down the open market route than they are on the cash buying, basically. Have they ever, because um, we obviously have done those, uh, mm. have they ever asked you to um, how is that different to just me leaving the house with current estate agent and just dropping the price down? Yeah, yeah it's a good question because right, we had this conversation earlier, didn't we? So it depends on, you've got to remember that they've really bought into you and you're going to have at this point good rapport with them because you, they've already told you they're going to accept 80 percent so you're going to have a very good relationship where they're going to trust what you're saying anyhow so well it depends they might be thinking about it or you know they're keen on it the, but either, to be honest even if they reject it and go i don't want to do that go that's fine well we've got this other solution yeah. same thing even yeah if exactly they, if you want to cross set if they are happy sort of like thinking about the cash offer or happy to go ahead if you want to transition if you want to give them another option where they decide if they want a two to four week cash offer or an eight week assisted sale 
if they reject the cash offer, you still you should always go yeah. in with an assisted sale. Because you're because you're. But how do you phrase it in that case? If they refuse the, the BMD. Like this, refuse it. Say it to me. Uh, I can make you an offer for seventy five cash, Lucy. Okay, great. I completely understand. We've got another same thing as Sam said. We've got another solution called assisted sell solution. Uh, we could probably get more fifteen percent of value. Would you like me to put that across to you? And then I'd go into the same pitch he yeah. would do. That's exactly it. Yeah, but, okay, but I, I hear you. But one thing in the, the pitch you're giving in that case is different from the one you talk about the guarantee level. You, you don't. You don't. You don't have to. The way That's you why I'm asking because yeah. in the way the adopters are written, you, it's written as a as guaranteed price. Yeah, but I, yeah, that's, so I, would, I would still leave that there, but I'd caveat it by saying you don't have to take that. So it, does, it makes no kind of difference in terms of uh, you can leave it there yeah. or you can just take it completely yeah, no, in out. In the, the interflow, the sole selling rights would just be you're guaranteed 80,000 and whatever we make, above, it's whatever you agree. So there's two ways you, you skin the cat. Yeah. I like cats. You can <laughs> either 80,000 and you say whatever we make above is our fee. You can go at it that way, or the reason why Sam teaches the 50% is because it's proven to close more. So you can say, whatever we make above this, we're going to 50-50, and Interflow does both of them percentages and we'll fill it out for you. So does it mean that, for instance, uh, if they refuse the, the BMD offer yes. right away, you, can still, you would still try to propose it yes. as a level yeah. of guarantee yeah. and because say the rest with the 50%? Yeah, because yeah, yeah. it's h highly unlikely that if you take a property to market at ninety percent on the open market, being that you're not going to sell it, I've I cannot think of all the low, uh, the, the tons of assisted sales I've done. If you if you're on the money in terms of your your valuation is correct, and you bring it to market at ninety percent to the open market, yeah. um, people are obviously willing to pay full market value in the open market. That is the premise, isn't it? You bring something that's ninety percent. You naturally, that's why you have to price it aggressively. Yeah, so it's like this. It's, it's like this. So let's just say they want to do it. They're getting a fifteen percent off. House is worth two hundred. They reject one fifty, or they're like, "I'm in an R-ring, but you think you can make more money?" You say, "Look, our offer for cash is at one fifty, but we know not everyone's willing to sell that price." So if they reject, we can offer them assisted sell, get them one set uh, one seventy, which is fifteen percent off and every, anything you make uh, above it. So what you do is you do come to the market at 10% off. So, so going back to Patty's question about why you would do it, it depends on the, sort of the, the situation in terms of, uh, well, let's say there's a cash offer there. Well, on the open market with a normal estate agent, you don't have the security of a cash offer in the background anyhow. That's the first point to make. Secondly, um, you've got the rapport where you can kind of build up the service and say, look, we're going to get professional photography because you would be putting a professional photographer. All that there's no cost yeah. to you as the vendor. Your costs that you would typically get are all taken within my 50% of the fee. So again, they're kind of thinking, okay, this is quite unusual in that sense. So they, in their heads, they're thinking, well, I was already going to, most if you've got the cash yeah. offer element, they're already going to take the cash offer, but they haven't got the headache of dealing with this. And they, the long and short of it is they know they're going to get more than the cash offer in probably slightly sh longer timescales because you're going to the open market. And when you've got the, the right, where it fits, it fits really well, if that makes sense in terms of solutions. What's the solution? Exactly. Like if, they re if they do reject the cash offer, then most companies don't have another solution. So if that house is worth 200, most companies, their solution to that problem is we're buy at 150. They don't really want that. But we say, look, it could, it's probably going to be around about eight weeks, but we could get you, we could either, let's just say you go down the, we split 50-50 percentage. So if you look here, you agree 160 and you go, look, we, we're going to go to market at 180. We're split whatever we make. So they're going to make 170 without any agent fees, no yeah. hassle. You're going to do everything for them without any fees. Or you say to them, look, you could probably get 180, 185, but it's going to probably take you about three or four months. So do you want to go our six to eight week route? or wait three or four months. Oh, I'll wait three or four months, fantastic. That seller will probably come back to you in a, a month or two. A lot of Alter's deals he's doing, he's not doing deals from the front end, they're all from the follow-up. They're all from three months later. That's where all the deals are now dropping, two to three months later. That's why in December he done six to seven. <coughs> Sorry, because they're coming from the follow-up of rejected B&Bs, basically. So using that example, 
They've agreed the deal. Yeah. Yeah. And then what would we do? We'd give it to Ben. Yeah, exactly that. So. And good then question. what would that cost us? Are you, or are, do we joint venture with Ben, or has? Yeah. Well, you, you'd have to ask. But I can't obviously okay. decide what his fee is going to structure. But he, he's a pragmatic guy and would come up with some fair deal, whatever that may be, yeah. basically. Um, but the good thing with assisted sales is he, even because of the last kind of way I was saying there's a sweet spot, there's good equity. So even if you've got to factor in a fee to the estate agent, you're still, even after all costs, you're still going to be clearing more than the B&V option at the beginning anyhow, basically. Find some marketing. Ben was quite open on your first deal just to have a fee and do it on the cheap side for his side so that people make some money and get used to business with you. Yep. And then once you've got one through, then he can have a bit more of a juicy estate in yep. assisted sales. That's fair enough, isn't it? Or have some negotiation there. He was quite open to it. Yeah. I think the key thing with assisted sales is you're positioning it that it's a, it's a, it's not, as fast as a cash offer, where everyone gets that. The trade offer is more time, but more money. And that's the yin and the yang. So it's a, you kind of position it that it's a faster than, a faster than normal solution. If, they, if they're holding out for full market value, your exit there is you refer the leads to Ben, so you get a referral fee. Yeah. That's, that's the, the last exit. And even in terms of selling the deals, again, put it up with Ben, but again, still do, this is uh, more for sellers, but still do, again, I would still do a gum free feature there. I would still put signs out in the area. I would still get it, I would do um, a Facebook ad, it's called a carousel ad, where you can have more than one image, so you can have the bedroom, the bathroom, the living room. I would still do that in the local area for advertising specifically to people that are looking to buy a house, I would absolutely do that. Basically, your goal is to hit every angle to get as much viewings in and sell the deal. But Sam said it's so right. If you take it 10% off to the market, who wouldn't? Let's just say you knew nothing about property. Do you know a lot of people, retail buyers, that are looking to buy a house so would be happy with 10% off? Mm, yeah. you, of course you would, right? They're saving 20 grand. <laughs> and if it's legit, it's very powerful. In terms of percentage, because that's something we discussed with somebody a bit earlier, yeah. Uh, that's probably something you said in one webinar, Sam, saying that up to maybe uh, 300, 350 k uh, going for 25 BMV, uh, 15% assisted sale is okay, mm. and 10% uh, when you sell on the market, but both parts, but you would go more to 20 or 15. Are you more, you're on about like being cash offer for BMV, right? Yes. Yeah, probably be about 15, so you would probably even it out, it'd be like 15%. Um, for an investor or like 10% because there's so much equity in it. But then what would be the equivalent above, I would say 400k for BMV assisted sale and what you put it on the market for? Um, you could put, you probably price it off 5% if it's a free 400,000 pound house. That's why Sam said the sweet spot is really t 250. Yeah. But it, it can work at any level. It's just yeah. about what you bring it to market. It yes. needs to be aggressive. So just to your point, let's say it was market value was 400k. Offers over 380 would be perceived. If you imagine the rest, let's say why it works, why assisted sales work very powerfully uh, on the open market is very few properties are on the market at their true market value. So, what I mean by that is, let's say you've got a house that's truly worth 400, so uh, that's the house you're talking about. The, the majority of the other houses would be on at 420, 425, and then you're bringing, to, so there's, there's the comparables, so these are all on the market and you bring in your assisted sale at 380, you're now comparing 380 to 425 for the similar type of houses, and that's yeah. why assisted sales fly out, because you've got a big perceived gap. I know there's the middle, which is market value, mm -hmm. but you've got the, the, the other options for a purchaser, and then your deal's here, okay. talking about 40 grand difference, and that's why yours will get lots of, sorry, the assisted sale will get lots of attention. Yeah. That has that potential where he's mar he, he marketed it three months ago at 420 and he's brought it down to 390 because he's an overseas um, landlord. Yeah. And how much? 450. Oh, yeah, and he's brought it down to 380. So he just wants to get rid of it because it's overseas. Yeah. But. How long has it been on the market for 380? Three, three months or four months? It's not, three months. <coughs> it's not worth 380 then. It's not worth 380. You'll find out it's, the real value. Uh, it's the old cliche, and it's the one that uh, is very powerful. A property, a property is worth what someone is willing to pay. It's the it's the benchmark for everything. So if something isn't selling on the open market at 380, 
it's not worth 380 to Tom's point. Every single time, there's no excuse. There's, unless yeah. there's something really random like, I don't know, there's a pig farm next door or something that would completely <laughs> knock saleability yeah, down. Yeah. But if it's been on the right move for three months at 380 and hasn't sold at 380, it's not worth 380. That is fact. <coughs> Obviously, he was comparable to him see whether it was yeah. like that. His only, his only objection would have been that he doesn't want to have anyone going to scare the tenant because there's been a long time right. tenant. Is well, he's got to say, no, he's got to say, no, say no, if you want to sell that. Is, is, is he selling it with a tenant in situ? Yeah. Well, they, that, they, that could that's be... That's not going to be an assisted sale then because... It, no, it, because obviously but, he wants to keep the tenant. But that might you would argue that that might be the reason why it could be worth that amount. But no one buys a house blind. Yeah, that's yeah. what it's called. Yeah. You wouldn't buy a house blind because <laughs> you want to see what's yeah, inside. Yeah, that's ridiculous. You've no got to be straight gonna, with the guy. No one is like, ever going to buy. You're going to have to organise it, otherwise we're out of the that, deal. That now. could be the reason why it hasn't sold Nicholas. and it could be worth that amount because <laughs> no one's going to buy it. Pay four hundred grand, but still, on a, a retail, an assisted sale, that won't work for a retail buyer because they want to live in it, right? Yeah, so if they he's selling it. it with a tenant and an agreement to stay in, yeah, um, for a long-term contract, and it's going to be more of a local landlord, or yeah, more of your local landlord types. Mm -hmm. So, when, um, let's say you have someone who agrees to assisted sale, and then you put it up with um, Ben, yeah, Ben. Ben. That's up to you. Uh, Ben's a very capable negotiator, so uh, it depends on how comfortable you, you guys are. I mean, it would, it, it could all be, it would all be relayed anyhow. Yeah. But uh, me personally, if I was newer, to, if I, I didn't come from an agent yeah, background, so. I would just let Ben negotiate on my behalf because he'll do a good job, basically. Okay. Um, but that's not to say that further down the line you could get involved but if you're paying a fee to Ben anyhow you might as well let him crack on and get and the dust price. The yeah yeah he can seller. do that yeah yeah oh, or you can if it's vacant use um, like access to view yeah. or viewer other option yeah especially they could do bulk viewings are powerful if you do bulk viewings mm -hmm. line them up so they see other people going in there because it creates scarcity yeah <laughs> people trust me like that's a bias and yeah anyway but it's, it's powerful. I'll post some stuff next week about that. But yeah, it's, it's really powerful because you want people to be invested in it. But yes, it's the sales. If you come to market le a legit price of 10% off, they will sell. And again, it's about pricing it correctly, but also making it attractive, like the photos. Yeah. It's really making it appealing. Because look, most products, are, a house is a product, and it's not marketed in a way to get people to view and make an offer, right? It's marketed in a way where the house looks horrible. It's not very, it's not advertised well. So if you can just get some good photos, you lock it under contract, you make it look a bit more advertising, and then, yeah. The difference between, say, professional photography and, yeah. and ship photography, though, is like, that is just so Huge, well man. apart, isn't it? You, you, the, the, you see. Well, I guess we all know that from what we've, like, from your own personal life, guys. Hey, guys. Just, yeah. Uh, for your own personal life as well, like when you go in and you say, I remember the apartment where I am, I mean, it's obviously a beautiful place, but I saw some other agents and I'm like, your photos are fucking crap. Yeah. Like, they are so bad. I'm like, what? They're, they're so different, day and night, compared to professional HD photos, beautiful photos, compared to crap. I'm like, man, this apartment, does, you're not doing it justice. Yeah. Uh, it's, it, that's huge, actually, to get photos. Write that down, guys. Get a local camera guy or even, yeah, you can get many people to do that, right? You just type, John. yeah. <laughs> well, you just type in professional photographer Manchester yeah. and you'll get five or six that yeah. specialise in just property photography. That's the key bit. That's all they do day in, day out, yeah. and they know how to move furniture, what lenses. Someone what might have like drone footage. Yeah, they love like drone they, stuff. Yeah. Right. It's powerful, you know, because Aerial it pulls people in. Jazz, I can say, this is how I sold my house back home last year. Yeah. I could not sell, you, you know, had my pictures with normal camera done and advertisements going and it's just like everywhere, you know, Russia and locally. And then my daughter says, why don't you hire somebody professional their lens, like they are um, wide angle. Yeah. It would make big difference. Afterwards, I had conflict. Three buyers. You know, they they, they just run. Yeah, yeah, they, they yeah. Fighting. Uh, oh, crazy. that's great. It works. 
It does work, yeah. Because it's a track. Yeah. Works, it's, yeah. It makes them sound Yeah, it's like a car, isn't it, or anything? Yeah. It varies region from region, but it's money well worth spending. You're talking typically, I don't know, between 150 to 300, depending whether or not you're where you are in the UK. London, you're obviously going to pay so, more yeah. than say. You're in the aircon. In the aircon. Yeah. You can do. I'd, I'm not a massive fan of them because there's there's a fine line where you want to entice people in. And if you give too much, like in a video, yeah, it's yeah, almost a reason yeah, for them yeah. not to go in. Yeah. Good photography will invite people in because it's, a, it's a, like a taster, isn't it? Videos, people can, in my opinion, they can make a decision without going into the property. And you actually want them to go in. The I property. think them little tips there, photos and a bulk viewing, that worked. I've had that so many times where an agent, even with investors, an agent, um, my partner as an agent, he would show around people and he would do 20-minute uh, slots and they would see the other guy coming out and then he would meet the other guy and go, hey, and then they would come in and we got so much offers yeah. for our deals. It was like, it was crazy. It's so powerful. So, and you can do access to view now to do this stuff. Yep. I, I just turned it down two degrees. Yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, fine. It's at 24. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Taking your shirt off now, Alex, are you? <laughs> <laughs> No, well, I, I, I've always used access to view, access to view for a lot of the outsource stuff and for basic photos. Um, I've, I've, I've compared them to Viewer, but the cost between the two is Viewer were, I thought, a bit of a rip-off compared to what access to view offered. Yeah. In terms of professional photography, I would, as in proper professional photography, I'd literally always just Google professional property photography, Blackburn. Yeah. And then somebody would come up in the region and then you'd negotiate 25 photos. And you could even post it, even local Facebook groups. It varies. It varies. And a lot of them would also do, would do a high spec floor plan as well. So I'd always add, get them to do that as a bolt on because they're there anyhow. And if you pay an extra 50 quid to get a really detailed floor plan, that again makes your listing stand out against the, the crowd basically so I'd always advise that yeah. if they do that yeah j just pay the extra 50 quid or whatever it is it's normally nominal because they're there anyhow and they're just like they normally always do it EPC energy yeah energy performance certificate so uh, every property that comes to the market has to have an EPC most properties have got EPCs yeah in the vast instance yeah. quite unusual because they've been around a while now um, they've got a 10 year 10 year period, so there's a, what's called the EPC register. I think it is epcregister.gov.uk, something like that. Um, and you can do a postcode check and uh, it will list, let's say you're looking at Smith Street, number 10. Um, if 10 Smith Street isn't listed, it means it hasn't got an EPC and you'll need to get an EPC guy or girl to go around. Um, most have an EPC and you just click on it and then you can download the EPC. Even if your access to view can do that as well, if you if, don't have yeah, one. Yeah, if it's if it hasn't been done yet. Yeah, it's great about these companies now. I think access to view was created for like overseas landlords originally, wasn't it? And online agents. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So when people say you can't do things remotely now, I'm like, guys, there's we're nothing. We're in freaking hell, man. Yeah. Like, are you still in 1940s or something? Like, yeah. huh? Do I, idiots? Yeah. Ten years. Yeah. Even working <laughs> there as been a lot of referrals. Property? Yeah, well, the old one, would, it's a bit of a weird system, but they would still be valid. But if if I was, most vendors, if they've got anything about them, <laughs> let's say they've had a big extension and all the windows and everything's been upgraded, you would get a new EPC for the sake of 75 quid because then it would improve your, EP, uh, your, your rating. Well, I'm actually asking you because on a few occasions when I was looking at some uh, properties on, uh, uh, well, right now, actually, yeah. when I looked at the EPC, I could see the EPC was not up to date. They obviously had made some, or from the pictures you could see they had made some refer, but... Yeah. Uh, well, no, a lot of people don't, don't update it. Okay. If, as soon as you have a new EPC, it cancels the, the, the does old it mean one. And that agents don't even uh, advise them to get a new one? Uh, I would. Yeah, no, no, but, but then that's I'm... Why, that's why, yeah. Okay. Yeah, not everyone would, no. No. Yeah. It's crazy not to, because if you've spent... I don't know, however much, and you've gone from like a, a D to say a B, that's a huge selling point because it's clearly far more energy efficient, isn't it? So um, yeah, as long as there's one in place, it doesn't, there's no legal requirement as in where it's, 
at to sell, there just has to be one in place, but a new one would cancel out the old one, to your point. Yeah. You know, a great thing to do, guys, go revisit a lot of sellers you spoke to and follow them up with an assisted sale offer. Just say, look, we can give you this, a text, you want to chat about it, 15% of the value, especially people you spoke to a few months ago, because it's a very, it's, it's easy for them to make a decision because they've got the benefits for them outweighs the negatives, right? There's no real negatives. There isn't really, it's just the time. That's, that's yeah. why I'd cover out that, because if you've got the time to go down that route yeah. and you've already, you're thinking about a cash offer, why would you not do the assisted sale and, yes. and probably gain more cash is the long and short sure. For sure. Any questions, guys, regarding the assisted sales? Yep, Patika. Uh, so you, you mentioned the, the best um, price range is uh, over 120,000. Well, does, yeah. does that mean you wouldn't go even if it was lower, say oh. under 100,000, which not? You, you yeah. just have to be, you just have to, it's because clearly the higher you go up, there's more equity yeah. that you can obviously play with. So even if you, the vendor was to take an offer they weren't quite happy with, you've still got a big equity buffer, which is key. Yeah. You can still cover your ass sub 100 grand by putting in the minimum fee to your contract. So let's say you were under 100 grand, where the figures are much tighter and you could, uh, be not caught out, but depending where offers were coming in on the current climate. But if you've got, say, a minimum fee of four grand, even after paying costs, you're still going to be making money and then kind of cover yourself. But they work, there is a sweet spot, say 120 to say 250 because of equity. That's amazing, cool. Any other questions, guys? You were good of that. Uh, 100 to 200, yeah. 200 to 200, yeah. 200. yeah. Okay. Good, okay, cool, guys. So team building as well. So um, what I recommend you do, again, uh, as a task for you to do later today is take the Myers-Briggs personality test, I'll type I'll post the personality test in there as well because it's going to give you your strengths and weaknesses and who you need in your team. So this isn't going to be relevant to everyone now. However, it's good for business partnerships. It's good for you, again, get the getting the right closes and so on. So uh, with building a team, guys, again, it's important you understand like, who wants to build a team in this business really here, right? Yeah. I mean, who can build a team now or... Is in position. Okay, so some people can, some people, some people aren't there yet. But anyway, it's important to understand it. So you want to focus again on your strengths, right? So when I was doing sourcing, you know, obviously now it's more on a partnership basis with with people that I just partner with. But when I had a sort of, when I was really focused on having <coughs> it like in a corporate way, is again my strengths was just the marketing, seeing the overview of the marketing and making sure I was pushing people forward. So what I did is I had, the way I structured it is I had someone on the phone, so the way Volta has it, someone on the phone taking the initial calls. And you can add some elements of this. And I don't do this now because this is, I didn't want to double down and create a multi-million pound sourcing business. I wanted to go other ways, but six figures, you can get away with doing it yourself or doing it with a partner. Um, but if you want to really have a business that just runs without you, then you basically work out every action that needs to be done and ask yourself, how can I outsource this? To someone in their strength. They've got to be in their strength. Because if you're trying to get them to manage VAs and they're not a manager, it's going to fall apart, right? Does that make sense, guys? You really need to get people in their strengths. And if you have that, you can have a very a business that just runs like clockwork. Like many of, uh, like a home buying company, right? We're basically like a home buying company, but we don't buy them. We just match them up with another buyer. Um, and th the way they have it is, again, they have obviously, you know, you can have you here. You're the you know, director of the business. So you're the one that's driving it, driving it home. Um, and then you've got, obviously, I don't recommend hiring putting people on pay and having employees for marketing, you want VAs to do that. So you've got a VA or VAs that are running the online marketing. So for example, things like small stuff, five, six pound an hour jobs, right? Um, you don't want to get pay someone, you want to pay someone five dollars to do this, not 10 quid. To do, again, your SMS marketing, your email marketing, your follow-up, all of these things, your VAs can do many different tasks. You know, they can get, you can have a VA doing your uh, outgoing marketing, your SMS, your lead scraping. It's not going to be... You can also have 
your VA is doing follow-up, for example, with an interflow, following up, making sure that every lead gets followed up. So for example, these are all small jobs, right? You don't wanna have, these are not skill-based jobs. They're not like, it doesn't take talent to do it. It just takes a little bit of focus and some buttons. It just doesn't, anyone can do it. But you don't wanna be bogged down doing all this stuff. So you might be able to implement just one of these things, but I wanna lay out the vision here of what some of the most successful students are doing right now that I see two to three years down the line and even some people in the group right now that are already applying this that are doing really, really well. Some of you guys really know them, so. Okay, so what you wanna do is you have your admin VAs. So these VAs do the admin, so what is that? They're following up with emails, they're doing your text messages, they're following up with text. So for example, on the follow-up, every week, let's just say 20 offers have been made. You wanna trigger, at the end of the week, at a certain day, you wanna have a follow-up day. So they go in and you trigger 30 days in advance to follow up with all with that week's leads of offers. Does that make sense? So let's just say you had 20 people that had offers. They all rejected. At the end of the day, you take all of them guys that re rejected and you set a text message and email 30 days later to follow up with them leads. Does that make sense? Guys, yes? Yeah. So that's simple, simple to do. If you need help on that, just message me. Um, so it's literally, hey, have you managed to sell your house yet? Or have you reconsidered? Something simple, right? And you can follow up with all the rejected people by email or text. Email's free, text is less than a penny. I don't know what it is specifically, but it's cheap. So you can do that, but you really want to look at getting a VA to do it because if you don't do it, it's not gonna get done. So you wanna look at everything, such as your SMS marketing. Are five to 10 messages going out every day without fail? Right? So this is quite a small task. That's quite easy to find someone. A lot of you guys could start implementing that straight away. So what happens then is you've got the phone. So leads have come in now and these people, these sellers you have need engagement. So there's that first call, right guys? Yes? You've got the initial call. So I'm not saying like, outsource your whole business now, but for some of you guys, you'll be able to add elements in. So I recommend if you've got the first call, have someone just focus just on doing that first call. Kind of good meeting with Troy. Hey Troy, listen to recording here. Um, we had a good meeting and basically he wants to outsource this entire business, has the business just running, right? And he wants to focus on buyers. That's where he really wants to focus on, building buyers, building co-sourcing relationships. So I said, the direct to vendor model is let's agree, we need leads, right? So how do we get them? From different sources. So for example, if you're adding Google AdWords and Facebook, that's a skill. That, that's a different focus and very different skill. You can't get a VA to do that unless they're skilled in that area. So for example, you might wanna get a Google AdWords manager to help manage it that's an expert in that. Make sense? Or you do it. Does it make sense, guys, right? Because that's more of a skill-based job when it comes. But sending direct mail, which you can do online, sending text messages is very simple tasks. You can get a VA to do that, okay? However, when it comes to, for example, like what me and Sam are doing, right? We're partnering up. So a VA is gonna be, um, you know, we're basically, we're mainly not really doing the scraping, but if we're doing some mail, the VA will do that. So they'll scrape the mail, they can pile a spreadsheet, we'll send them through Interflow. When it comes down to YouTube and Google, I've got a specialist that I work with, because I, I, I'm passionate about it, I like it, I've got a skill in it, to make sure we, we're crushing it with Google and Facebook. So we, I work on that with a guy, but my guy is to get him, I'm training him up, nurturing him, to get him to manage them campaigns. So what happens if leads come into Interflow, Again, I'm partner with Sam, so Sam's getting on the phone to close the deal. Um, so the way I've done it is I'm doing the marketing, Sam does the offers, makes the offer through Interflow. So Sam's role is just offers, that's it. My role is the marketing. Does that make sense, guys? So my role in the business of sourcing is the marketing and also making sure that, yeah, things are ticking, we're working together, okay? But, for example, someone like Volta, what he's got is he's got someone that makes the initial calls. They just do that. Two people now. 
Yeah, okay, two people now, right? But it's the same thing. So people that do the calls. So that is their only focus, is making the calls. And you could have this person do the calls and the comps. That's it. Calls, comparables, tag the closer. So a lead comes in, a VA's done the marketing and sent the mail, or you're, or you're doing your Facebook ads or whatever, right? Leads come into the system. It all starts with a call, a comp, which is the valuation of the property, and an offer. There's three steps. Get leads, make the call. Do the comparable, make the offer. So if you've got a person just focused on the calls and comparables, that is their role, right? And the person that makes the offers validates the comparables to make sure that person was doing the comps right. And all they do is offer, send offer. They don't worry about follow-up. They don't worry about anything. They're just offer. So your role might be that person, just offers. Does that make sense, guys? So your role, your activity in your business might be you literally just focus. If you look at a timeline, again, it depends on where you are, right? Some of you guys can do that now. Some of you guys want to do a little bit of everything. I recommend if you're doing texting and stuff, though, get a VA to do that. Scraping. You shouldn't be texting. You shouldn't be scraping. You need a VA on that. When it comes to Facebook and stuff, I recommend you do it at first which I had to learn and then when you, because most people you hire, they don't know anything about it. They're, they don't have a clue about how online marketing works. They just say they do. Okay, so you've got to be careful. You need to really understand it before you get someone and you're lucky because you can just learn from me and then when you get someone in there, they can be the executor. Does that make sense guys? Yes, with the Facebook stuff. Um, so a lead comes in. So we've done some, some SMS or Facebook or some direct mail, right? Sent us in into flow, you've got the leads. So this is where the first call happens. So you could have someone do a fact finder. So their job is to basically say, hey, get on the phone. You could have a, a, a VA do it or you could you can hire someone that is good at that. They've got to be good. If you're gonna find someone in there, they have to be, they have to be swift. They have to have some charisma. They can't be like, oh, hello. Like they need to be able to leave a good impression guys because you can't just have any VA on the phone doing the first call believe me you can't do that you need to have someone it could be a VA from the Philippines but they need to be able to you know what I mean they need to have some rhythm they need to be able to communicate well and they need to be able to understand the English tonality and humor of the way we are so they need to be able to take a bit of pressure they can't be like crush under pressure but this person's job is just getting the facts, the mortgage, the situation. And their goal is to book an appointment, find out what this property is worth. That's all they do, their daily activity, take the calls as quickly as possible, do a comparable and tag the closer, that's it. No offers, no marketing, no thinking about what they're gonna do. They just take the first call, they do the comp, but that means that you've got someone there. As leads come in, they call immediately. And they're focused on making them initial calls. That's how Volta set, it, set his system up. And that's just the way he's done it for himself. But again, everyone's different. He's got a market, he's got a budget to do that. Not everyone has that. So again, you build up. It just depends on where you are. But you have to make sure if you're getting someone to the calls, they've got to be extremely efficient and a good executor. They can't be like, twiddling their thumbs, you know, they need to get on the phone quick, okay? Um, and then, that, so it's basically like a home buying company, they have that. So like national home buyers, they have someone does the calls and then it goes to a department that closes and then they nurture that deal basically. I think he's outsourced possibly the Facebook ads and everything else. So yeah, but he'd done them himself to understand them though, yeah. Them, yeah, that's great. Um, and then this person, which is probably you, does that mean you can't outsource it later on if you like it? Look, like, I partner with Sam. Sam's really good at the office. He's one of the best at it in the country at doing it, and he likes it. I'm not really, I'm not too into that. I like the marketing. Sam wouldn't want to sit on Google and YouTube, do you know yeah. what I mean? He'd rather be on the phone closing. Oh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'd rather not be on the phone, so it works perfectly. 
But so Sam's just like, offers done. It's not writing about techie or following up or anything like that, it's just offers. And that is quite a simple model, guys. It's not rocket science. And then we just work together to nurture the deal. So do we find a buyer? Then you come together with your closer, if you outsource it to another closer, to talk about how we're going to sell this deal. Right? Or you just take control of that. So for example, when I was talking to Troy with his plan, he goes, I want to be in control of the buyers. I really like that. I want to do that. So you could partner in here to close or you could get your own closer. You can get a commission basis closer. I've had that. Thing with commission bit, with someone that's commission based, here's one rule. You've got to be giving them good leads because it's unfair on someone to say, look, like, yeah, you've got to be give, injecting the leads for that person. So they've got opportunity to do business, to do deals. But does it, can you see the system, guys? Yeah? So the closer, they, what's their role? And that might be you right now. So if you're overwhelmed with the initial calls and the comparables, you might look at going, actually, my first hire is going to be someone that's freaking really good at their stuff and getting them on the comps. And then all you do is validate the comparables and make the offers. That's all you do every day. Offers, 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 because that's a skill. You can't just quickly outsource your offers. Do not believe me? You can't just get someone to go make offers. Partner, in, partner with someone because they've, you've been indoctrinated right in, the, in our training. But just to hire someone randomly, it's going to take a, probably three months if you do that, to hire, to train someone up fully. I'd rather partner yeah. in the group. It's quicker in the partner in the group, yeah, do that. But this person, again, this might be you. All you do, again, you make the offers, and then you send the offers. You make the offers, you send the offers. But you're the business owner. So you, as a business owner, you've got to be, the skills you must develop, guys, is you must be, um, for you, in, in your business, you must be doing this. You must be, you must be looking at the metrics. You must understand where you, how do you make a decision to move forward? So do you, if you're generating a lead for 100 quid, say, but you only need 15 leads to do a deal, that's ROI there. If not, then you, as a business owner, you don't make a decision to scale up that marketing campaign if it's not bringing you money. But again, if you're not making offers on every lead, you're not going to know if it works. Right? That's why we always say you have to make sure you're making offers. You've got to be able to, um, you know, drive forward. So, if you have someone, um, if you have a closer, you need to make sure that you're managing them properly, right? And you need to make sure that, yeah, that it's, a, it's accountable. So you can use tools. For some of you guys that do that, you can use like tools like um, Vox is a great quick communication tool, and a project manager, Asana or Basecamp. So if you've got a project with your team and you want to move forward, you can use like Asana or Basecamp or Voxer. Um, and that's it really, guys. Again, it's about really you making sure that you know your role. Because say, for example, people use Volta. Just use him as an example because it makes sense because he's one of the only people that have a team right now. All he's really done is just, okay, he's got someone on the calls, do the comparables and offers, and to do marketing. And it's just, it runs like that, right? But that's not going to happen to everyone straight away. So what I think you shouldn't outsource and you should get good at is offers. Or if you really don't want to do them, partner in the group. But they have to be committed to do it. OK, guys, does that make sense? Yeah. And get them to do that Myers-Briggs test. Just get them to go through that test to see their personality to make sure that they're compatible with that with that solution, but um, who's gonna, who wants to outsource more? Who is going to start outsourcing a bit more? Yeah. What are you going to outsource, guys, that put your hands up? Maybe leads, yeah. Any specific marketing there? Uh, SMS scraping. SMS scraping, yeah. And emails. Emails. Anything else, guys, you're going to outsource? What are you going to outsource? Facebook ads. Facebook ads, yeah. You want to outsource it all? Just the stuff that you said to outsource them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, everything. Who has a VA now? Who's still texting themselves? Texting? Emailing? Scraping for direct mail? I do some of the scraping because I don't quite trust VA to do some of it. How come? For example, um, with um, the possession, it's quite fiddly. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay, the repositions, yeah. Yeah, so I wouldn't. Yeah. And um, I've just only now started um, look, doing the age leapings as well. On yeah, the, yeah, right move. Yeah, I put that on my side as yeah. well because kind of you have to spend some time looking things up on yeah. Google Maps and I don't trust them to actually do it properly. Yeah. So now. Yeah, I, yeah, I would. I mean, in terms of like negative equity mailing and stuff like that, you can get, um, you can actually go on. I'll do a video for it. You can go on land registry and just export two free bed semi detached houses or terrace. Everyone that bought in two thousand and seven, two thousand and six, you can just press a button, export the spreadsheet, so you can send mail. That works. Mail, it's just incredible. It works. Mail just works. It's always works. It always will work. Um, um, you can go on the land registry and you can go on um, its data, it's basically house data and you can type in specific dates and specific years and uh, property type. So if you want to target two to three bedroom houses in this area that bought at, in this price range from two to three bed house, 50 to 150 grand, the bought in 07 to 08, it will give you hundreds of thousands of people or tens of thousands, however, what, how much you want. So it saves that because a lot of people go, but they might not be for sale, it doesn't matter. Mm. Again, marketing's a numbers game. We don't, it's just get it out there. We know 90% of them people won't have any equity though, because we've done a market research. We know it's a Northern area. We know the market's not recovered. And we know the majority of these individuals are not gonna have any equity in the house. So it's very specific. So when you get calls come in with your negative equity tracking number, you know that when you get on the phone, you're going to position them down to people that have no equity. So mail, guys, you need to be doing more. Some of you guys need to be doing some more mail. Um, and you can start off with as little as 50 quid or 100 quid. Again, I would look at, if you're doing mail, start off, I would look at, say, a 3% response rate and then maybe with a follow-up, 1.5, 2. So you send 1,000 out, you get 30 calls. <coughs> You're going to have probably 10 duds, 10, hey, why did you send it to me? 20 people that actually want to sell. Normally, that's what I've found. I guess a numbers game. One of, you know Gregory Hodges, a hilarious guy, a Money Love Speed interview? He sent out about 35,000 letters a month. That's why he made half a million in a year. <laughs> because every, when he would make money, he would reinvest. You should always be reinvesting 30 to 40% of your revenue back into marketing, guys. You've got to follow that rule. If you do it, you're going to have a consistent business. That's the marketing game. So when I've got here, but the marketing rules, that's all I'm going to talk about it. It's consistency. You know, you need to know your numbers and you need to have some balls, you know? <laughs> as simple as that. But it's not, it's, not a, it's not gambling. It's like someone come in right now with a perfect stock and said, look, this stock is incredible. If you put this in, you're gonna get this out. That's what it's like. Marketing is a numbers game, but the only reason you wouldn't go big in marketing is you don't trust you're gonna make offers that Sam talks about. You've got to master that. That's what we talk about gum tree and driving for dollars because there's just time involved. But if you trust yourself, then you can start to scale up and that's when it becomes really exciting because I've dropped you know, 10,000 letters before. You just, your phone blows up. Um, you, yeah, but you need to make sure you're ready for that. Does that make sense? Like, don't just go, I'm gonna drop 5,000. <laughs> you're like, I remember Matt did that and he had like 120 calls come in. It was, it was like, man, I, I got it. Oh, that was hilarious. But he just, he was like so motivated. He dropped like, I think 5,000 letters yeah. and he had about 150 calls or something crazy. And his phone was blowing up and he obviously, I think he broke he even. Didn't, he didn't stage it, did he? That was didn't stage it, correct, yeah. He didn't stage it. So does that make, does that help guys with the team? We can do a webinar on that. Would you like me to do a webinar on it? Yeah. Yeah. Do a little bit deeper on it? Because I've done this, I've personally done this and I know what works and I've done mistakes as well. And I think really for some, most of you and your personalities, you need to start off one at a time. La Volta is someone that sort of, he does things at speed, it's different. Um, and you know, it take, it's taken about eight months. So just start off step by step. On, on the direct note, you're talking about staging it. Yes. Well, if it, it depends. If it, let's just say you get you sent out, is it 3 yeah, three percent response. So it depends how much calls you can handle, really. Um, so if you send out two hundred fifty a week, you're going to get what about seven, eight calls a week. Yeah, I've got four hundred leads here and another five hundred to go on to Interplay. So yeah, you should focus. But so here's the thing: what I what I've observed, guys, is sometimes you've got so much actions to do. You've got to go. Where is the ROI actions? Because you could have so much coming in, what is the real stuff that's going to make you money? 
That's what you've always, gonna be, always got to be asking yourself, otherwise you become like a busy fool. You're just like, not saying you, Alex, but I'm saying in general, like I've been there when I'm doing 50 things, I'm like, okay, what's the main thing that is going to make me money and I like, oh, this. So you've got to ask yourself that rather than going 50 new things, wow, you know, like just focus on the cause and don't overwhelm. That's why it's good about staging outsourcing as well. So let me just focus on getting an initial caller. Not initial call in a Facebook ads guy and a Google ads guy and you know, it's gonna be like, ah oh, man, my head's everywhere. Okay? Um, does that make sense guys, yes? Are you with me? Yeah. I can't hear you guys, yes? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, buyers. Buyers marketing. Um, so we're focusing on buyers. So again, Sandra, you got your shirt? Okay, yes. Where are you going with that shirt? Auctions. <laughs> Auctions, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, like these two here, networking meetups, call it NMU, networking meetups, these are great. Like you could get a really good group of buyers, but here's what you got to do also. How can you also leverage other um, sources, buyers? For example, you guys, Shreesh Bhavna, with your deals, right? A lot of that, there's a lot of leverage involved. <coughs> you got passed by a sourcer, then you found another sourcer that had a buyer. Does that make sense? Like, um, even your buyer where you sold your leads deal, were they on, was that previous networking? Or was that within a community group? Um, no, that was from, that was from a previous yeah. uh, was, We had a buyer's list initially. So we were developing a buyer list, that was through Gumtree. Okay, cool. Yeah. So Gumtree. So basically guys, like Gumtree, what do you do? Just post ads, we buy houses, ghost ads, you know, some people don't like doing it, it's up to you, whatever, you know, like just post an ad that says discounted by to let properties, keep the language simple. But you wanna try to use auctions and network meetups. Like, on auction, you gotta have balls to go to an auction by yourself with a shirt, do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, I'm not gonna be, I'm not, I'm not gonna say like, it's easy, but if you go within mastermind groups, four or five of you, how, you have a good day out, have a laugh, you do good business, it'd be good. Well, I don't know why you guys don't do that. You, you allergic to each other or, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, who has the balls to do that, Sandra? <laughs> Alex, yeah. <laughs> I would go in with a freaking hat. You should, you should, do you know what, you should order a yellow one. <laughs> even louder. Yes, even louder. Um, guys, remember what I said with the scorecard, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to get a deal. You can't be like, oh, okay, what people think, fuck them. Do you know what I mean, who cares? I, I don't give two dams. They're not gonna feed my family and people I love. Like, oh, you look silly, fuck off. Do you know what I mean? Like. It doesn't matter, everyone will actually think it's awesome. And it's, it's actually proven marketing. Like it's a lot of companies, corporate companies do that. You know, when they're doing ice cream, free samples, they've got the shirts. Like, it sounds a bit silly, but I think it's actually fun. Um, especially if it can net you five grand a month, <laughs> then it becomes fun, doesn't it? <laughs> then it, see, it's your, how you see it. Oh, I'm gonna be stupid and it's for nothing, or actually I do it and I make five grand, which I can turn into more, right? It's just the way you see things. So Gumtree works well. Network meetups. Who's going to network meetups now? Raise your hands. Awesome. Like for you guys, are you going? Are you going with people? Have you? Are you going by yourselves? Or? Let's go by myself. London, Brentwood. Okay, nice. Um, Lucy. Yeah. We, okay. Awesome. So you just go, show up, network, speak. Awesome. That's great. For some of you other guys, is that what's held you back? Like time, or is it just like, oh, it's not worth it? Like I don't know what's the ROI of it. Who's had that where it's like, oh, it'd be good, but. I've, I've looked at a few of them, but it's just been like the silly seasons has gone past and other things. Yeah, and yeah. It's actually had so many different things on the plate. Yeah. But for example, if you've got a deal that you need a buyer for, they could be at the fucking network meetup. Mm -hmm. They could know someone, you know, like it could be this, you know, it could be a, some of the deals you've got that could, that could make you a millionaire, man. Like get your ass there. <laughs> you know, like it's. I've been to them before. Yeah, yeah. But I would say form little partnerships here, guys. It's a good group, everyone's positive. Start really getting around people that are really focused on the same thing. I think that's
that's powerful. So yeah. when you guys went to the Grant Cardone event, that was fun, right? How was it? Was it fun? Like, did it feel good going with a few people you know? Like, it just, you know, like... It's quite funny because, uh, like, the other people who were within the event uh, were very keen to actually meet up and just exchange just the business cards and just kind of network. That's awesome. Yeah, Grant Cardone's events, you will, you know. He, he attracts the crazy ones. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, correct. Uh, <laughs> so Gumtree works. Another one that very few people do is signs. You know, we have fixer-upper properties available. We have refurbishment deals available. Getting, getting someone to put them up on a weekend. It just works because it's outdoor ads. Um, another one for buyers is I would really start, you can do this tonight. You can look at other we buy home com sorry, companies that sell below market value deals and other deals and leverage them, message them and see, say, we have deals coming in. Can we co-source? Can we negotiate? So, for example, if you type in below market value properties, you'll see some guys that advertise on pay-per-click that are sources. And there's some big London sources as well that only do like luxury properties. So for some of you guys that are getting in the high-end properties, they might have a hungry buyers list ready to snap them up because you're leveraging their marketing, their paid ads. So you know it's working, otherwise they wouldn't be spending money on ads. So I really start to look at how can I get to my goal quicker, not with my own efforts, with other people's efforts. You know, that's business really, guys, isn't it? It's a team, right? It's a team of people. You can get there a lot faster with the right people in place. You don't have to employ them. They could just be someone in this room that you can work with. Do we have yeah, a place where everyone put the home buying companies that they're working with in one place so we don't go... Uh, well, if you, could, if you could do a post maybe later and then people yeah. can... I mean, I, I haven't done that yet, but I know lots of people have already secured. We don't want to be well, we've, we spoke about that, me and Sam. A lot of people are, uh, have not... They're not focused on it though. Yeah, no, but I know some people have secured things with these, yeah. these guys. Maybe the guys that have really can... Good for those of us who are still going to do this strategy, not to be mailing the same one to get the same... Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah, true. Are you yeah. Sure? Are you sure they're going to get paid for it either way? Yeah, well, the unethical companies will. But we've worked, me and Sam, we and Sam have first hand experience in this. We've worked with about five companies, four or five. And if you get the good ones, they won't do that because they know that they're like that company, good property buying company, whatever the heck they're called, they're burned now. They're not, that's not good. You know what I mean? They were selling you crappy leads. Well, now we know now. So they've obviously done that of other people, now their reputation's down the line and it's going to hurt them down the line. Because yeah. karma comes back, you know? Yeah. So you just focus on, you shouldn't let one knock stop you. Because I've worked with some companies that have been fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Best quality leads, in my opinion. Yeah, because they're doing Google ads, you know? Yeah. A lot of money, newspapers and stuff. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, any questions regarding the buyers as well? LinkedIn, good, because people are expecting a direct message on LinkedIn. And you can also get to the people that are higher in the, yeah. um, in the like, directors and stuff like that. So LinkedIn works well. And there's a lot of people you can search via keywords. So with LinkedIn, you can actually type in by their job title. So, you know, I've got videos on this. I've talked about it before. I'll be focusing a lot on buyers because I think it's a big thing you guys need to focus on. But I've talked about how you can contact property buyers, property sources. So when you're going in LinkedIn, you can go job titles and type property sources or property yeah, traders. Videos, in the bot in Kajabi, in the buyers section, but marketing for buyers. LinkedIn. LinkedIn, I think I've done loads of webinars on it, um, but that's fine. I, I'll do another video on LinkedIn um, specifically. Uh, I think I'd, in the mini guru training. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, there's a mini guru training. I'll talk about it. But as far, I'll do a webinar on it. Um, I'll talk at LinkedIn. What you want to do is you just want to go on the title, yeah. job title, and you can search via job titles or you can search via, um, I think, mainly job titles and groups. So if you have looking for buyers, so type in property investor or home buyer. Yeah. Don't just type property sourcer, type property trader. You're trying to target your LinkedIn, uh, what's the word, connections. 
as, as best as you can and then you'll find your feed starts filling up with more property stuff and then if you really target kind of the sourcing stroke property business there's you'll find there's good connections in there to, to, to work with and then once you've got a bit of a following then you can start either advertising your deals there co-sourcing or you can actively go I've got a deal in Doncaster has anyone got a buyer for XYZ so on and so on do you do any specific uh, do you engage with them in the meantime or do you, do you publish something in the meantime or you just do it when you've got a deal uh, but all, all of the above it depends. Um, I mean, I've, I've written blogs before to encourage traffic. Um, I think just if you kind of spend time on it and connect um, and use it as a tool and target the people you need to be targeting to kind of what Tom's saying there, um, it's very powerful. I've, I've, I've got some really good connections that I've met through LinkedIn and have built really good working relationships with. And I've met them and now we regularly meet up for, for coffees and, and business is, is, is good. So, um, yeah, I think link, LinkedIn is really underrated and people don't use it to how, you, it's like anything, you have to put effort into it. There's no point just having a profile on LinkedIn then hoping it's going to come to you. Do you know what I mean? You have to kind of go looking for whatever you need and spend time on it. And if you spend time on it, you're, and how your profile's written, even like your, the, the photo you've got of your headshot, how you've spun your experience, because not everybody's come from a property background. You need, you need to, it needs to put you in the best possible light. And sometimes you see, I don't know, punctuation, spelling mistakes, all these little things. It's like, it's important because it's effectively your brand. It's your integrity, your credibility, either or other. And how you kind of present yourself. If you're looking, say you're trying to connect with an asset manager in London who's dealing with like billions of pounds worth and you've got like, I don't know, a crap photo and, and spelling mistakes all over it. They're not going to deal with you, are they? And that's, this is why it's kind of really important that how you kind of position yourself is important on LinkedIn because ultimately it is a professional site. It's not Facebook. You just need to think about how you're being perceived by the people you're trying to connect with, if that makes sense. Because a lot of people don't take that seriously. And it's like, I'll, I'll often get connection requests every day. I'm just like, who's this joker? I'm not... Do you know what I mean? It's like, this is business. If I'm looking at a LinkedIn profile and it's just littered with mistakes or it's just a bit Mickey Mouse, whatever, then I'm not going to, I'm not going to waste my time connecting with them. Cool. So yeah, the buyer marketing again, when I incorporate, you know, Facebook ads again, it's great for buyers and they've been talking about YouTube as well. Um, there's also some organic stuff you can do for free. Um, and that's basically like little things like merchandise, right? Having a shirt going to auctions. It can be a quick one, I think. Cool shirt and just have, you know, we, we source properties, right? People will come up to you. And networking as well. I've read up to network. <laughs> it's great, isn't it? I love it. If, it's, if, it's, if people think you're silly around you and they think you're nuts, then that means you're doing a good thing. If no one thinks you're like crazy for what you're doing, that means you're not doing anything great. You know, you've got to have people sort of be, that's strange to be like, okay, great, well, it's making me money, so I might as well do it, you know? So, again, it's one of them things where you just go do it. Again, with tenant buyers, as well, it's a similar thing, right? Like, again, you've got Gumtree. Having like a, a featured ad. Get them up on, on Zoopla, the portals, right? For that with, say, Ben. And also looking at um, you know banner signs. Local Facebook ads. But again, the ones to start pretty quickly, you can get an ad done pretty fast. Again, these ones you can get done pretty fast. You can get them done within again, it doesn't take long. That should be your main checklist. Get it up on the portals, get it featured on Gumtree, make sure it's featured so it stays there longer, get some local signs out um, as well, it just works. And normally that is enough. If you are struggling to find a tenant buyer, it's gonna come down to either the option fee is too high, or you're not getting, you're not, when you're on the phone, you're not negotiating in a way that's attractive for them, right? So it's important that, again, you learn how to close. So you've got also think about, guys, what's the problem with a tenant buyer? What's the solution that we're giving for a tenant buyer? So if you're sourcing a tenant buyer for a landlord or seller, what's the solution for this individual? We're getting them on the housing ladder. They need no, they don't have to have good credit to start, no mortgage to start. 
What's another benefit? Security. Security. They can make improvements on the house. They can treat it like it's their own. They've got a fixed price. Any equity increase, it says. Fixed, hmm? fixed, fixed rent. rent. Again, they've got that security, right? It's that mindset of you can't buy a home, but you want it because the emotions feel good of having a home. You can either wait three or five years to either on your books, self-employed, make money, good credit, etc., etc. right? To be able to qualify for a high street mortgage. Well, in the meantime, why can't we be the bridge where you can still rent to own this home and when you can qualify, which we make sure we encourage you to work with a mortgage broker to make sure you're following the steps in terms of qualifying. And in the meantime, for five grand, you can move in and start owning, have the option to buy this house and own this house. And with the tenant buyers, you can give them, you, let's just say it's a five grand deal, right? And they go, ah, five grand, how much have you got? Uh, I've, got I've got three grand, okay, great. Well, what we could do, three grand down, then we can do a, a payment plan for the rest. Okay, as simple as that, guys. You just got to be flexible. Do a payment plan for the rest, or you can, or you do free grand. They're in, right? So it's just about it's either the, the option fee is too high, bring it down a little bit, or the rent is too ridiculously high, bring it down. That's the only reason. Or it's in a really rundown council estate, and the house is just an, an absolute wreck. Which try and keep try and keep away from. Does that mean you still can't do it? You still can because some people want to make improvements on the house, but try your best to stay away but it still works so i've had phil and karen they done nine deals sourcing tenant buyers for landlords and they were all in rundown areas in the northeast so it does still work no offense to people in the northeast then it all run down <laughs> god put that out there but you know you never know but joking aside it works but you must make sure if it's not working if you're not getting a tenant buyers you're either not getting enough quality leads which you mean you're not applying all of these channels. Number two, you're not closing them. You're not closing them. So, the same as we marketed in assisted sale, follow the same approach. Good photos, get people in the door, do a bulk viewing. Exactly the same approach as what Sam was talking about for an assisted sale, you do for a tenant buyer. And you close them. So what happens when you get a tenant buyer goes, I want the deal? Like they need a solicitor, right? So you've got the option under control and a tenant buyer has the option to buy from you. So I, rec I always get them to pay their own solicitor fees, the tenant buyer. So I get them to pay their own fees and then I get them to engage with my solicitor to draw up to make sure the option's signed. And that's it. I get a standard heads of term signed with the tenant buyer. So if tenant buyer goes, I want it, standard heads of term signed, I get them to pay a deposit. And then the rest is paid, just like a B&B deal. You get a below market value deal in, it's a grand deposit and the rest on completion. Same as a tenant buyer, they go, what do I do next? You pay a simple, uh, small, they do a viewing, they want it, small deposit, instruct the solicitors. Oh, well, I don't have a solicitor, Tom. That's not a problem, we can recommend a solicitor that specializes in rent to own. Okay, that sounds great. Email, CC. Hey, I'm a sourcer. <laughs> I've got a lease option. Can you, re uh, can you represent this person? They, can you reach out to them and move forward? We received a thousand pounds. Here's our heads of terms confirming. They reply, okay, great. We've instructed the tenant buyer and we're drawing up the contract. It's, li it's like that, Sam, isn't it's it? Exactly that. It's exactly that. Yeah. But in your mind, <laughs> like you're just everywhere. If you're missing anything, the solicitor's going to ask for it. Yeah. Right away, you're just you're a matchmaker. That's all we are, guys. We're just matching. If you're in the middle, you're still like, okay, I've got a buy. I've got this property now. I'm in control of this now, just like it's your own home. I've got this tenant buyer. My first step is one. I know they need representation, so it's either going to be one of mine, or it's going to be their solicitor. So their solicitor might not know anything about it. So we want to get them to engage with the solicitor that drew uh, drew up our contracts. Yeah. Pop for a tenant buyer, receive deposit, instruct them to get their solicitor to speak with yours. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Just film me, man. <laughs> um, yeah, it's literally like, that's it. And then you've got the member. CC, tag. I don't know. Hey, Tom, Sam, what do I do? Just say this. And then the solicitor will tell you, we're missing this. I just want to confirm. Because remember, they are representing that individual. They're not going to be coming to you. You're just the person that, you're like a referrer. 
but they know that they've got to hold the other fee in an account and then it's released. So that's why we send them the heads of terms. That's why it's there, really. Just to lay out the basic structure of the yeah. contract. Yeah. But in Jordan's case, he's officially on title. So it's just an assignment. So like, that's it, really. They just say, OK, in control of this house, tenant buyer wants to buy this. They need representation, and an option needs to be done. And that's it. It's as simple as that. And the solicitor will tell you what they need. And it's as simple as that. It's like, OK, all I care about is it goes through and I get paid. So let me secure the deal. I want It's a £1,000. It's just invoice. £1,000 down to make sure they're serious, and the rest upon completion. Like Zaf that just sorts deals. £1,000 in, secure the deal, and the rest will be, uh, will be paid when conveyancing's done. So now your job, because people ask us, what do I do in between this time? Your job is to make sure you're in communication with the tenant buyer, to make sure they're all good. It could be an investor as well. Just to make sure, hey, any questions? Did you get the contract back on time? Because trust me, people are lazy and they won't. So you want to make sure that you just keep things smooth. It's like a timeline. It's like from here to here, you just got to nurture the deal until completion. To be honest, it's quite simple. But I was just going to add right. to that. It's just sales progression in, in a state agency, but the, the, the best thing you can do is to, uh, is to basically bring up the solicitors and just say, um, obviously I'm the agent or the broker for the deal of Smith Street, is there anything that you need chasing? That's the, probably the most powerful question you can ask, because they've got loads of stuff on their plates, and if you're chasing down whatever they're missing, and if the likelihood of the deal obviously going uh, falling out of bed is going to be reduced, that's where your role is really important, is to be chasing down whatever needs to be chased down effectively. So let's say, I don't know, there's a bit of signed paperwork that's not been signed by the vendors. You, you obviously get that from the solicitor straight on the phone to the vendors and say, look, you, you run the risk of the field collapsing it. You need to get that signed paperwork back first class um, to the solicitors, whatever it may be. Yeah, so yeah. You're there to chase, sales chase. Yeah. Sales chase and use every time. Yeah, you're just yeah, you're just seeing it through to completion basically. And some the great people, some of you don't do it, and it's yeah. probably one of the most. This is the bit where a lot of brokers' agents are earning their money because there's no good just completely chucking on the table and hoping for the best. You've done the hard work at this point. It's like you might as well spend a few hours for the next couple of weeks chasing down where things mm. are done because the likelihood of you, uh, the likelihood of the deal falling out of bed if you're chasing it massively drops. Yeah, and it's making sure that, you know, with the vendor, again, they get the agreement back. So the goal is to get that agreement signed. So it's to nurture them, so you can give us a call, we can walk you through it, whatever, do a Skype call, whatever is beneficial for them. You always want to make sure they've got certainty so you're there to help them. With the buyer, it's the same thing. You break it down step by step. So look, here, this is what's going to happen. Do this, do this, do that. Get the agreement back signed. Explain it, rent to own. Make sure, because the solicitor will say, well, here's the risk, here's what you're doing. So we'll go through that with them and say, look, here's the risk, but at the end of the day, you've got the option to buy. It's going to be very similar to what the price is expected to be based on market research. As so you just keep it simple, it's not having a long script. It's just basically breaking down the key points. Um, but like I said, guys, we're here. That's why we're here. So when you need something to say or an email swipe or anything, we refer you to the files. Or we just say, look, send this, say that. Don't say this. You know, like if you didn't join and you were saying lease options over the phone, that would screw up all your deals, you know? Little things like that. The tenant buyer just needs a regular solicitor to be sign assigned the lease option. Yeah? You don't need a specialist lease option solicitor for that. They could use it. Basically, they just want to engage with the solicitor that drew up the option, really. Yeah, what yeah. Needs to be assigned across to go and that's done. Yeah, but with the, isn't it, Sam, like they have their own separate option, the tenant buyer? Yeah. Like they've got a separate option to buy, so it's not just an assign, it's not just a quick assignment. They, they actually have an option to buy a separate option. They have an option to buy this property. So they do need a lease option. They, they need a solicitor, a uh, lease option solicitor to draw oh, up a contract. Lease option yeah, yeah. Okay. Can they use the same one that you've been using? 
Nogsev representing, uh, well... Did the same solicitor represent both parties? No, you know, a separate solicitor for that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, because that would be conflict of interest. Yeah, yeah. Got the arms length. yeah and then, you know, obviously, she's, just make sure she understands if the solicitor has the option. She's, it's gone through, right? She signed the contract, Alex. She signed the contract, right? The option. If you'll do. What, for, Jordan, for she's her. signed, she's actually, she, it's she gone. Now, she now has the option. She and that title? Make sure she understands it at land registry. She's now okay. She has that created. It's done. Okay, I, so I, I presume she's got that. Okay. I mean, what she's been doing all this time is she hasn't got that done. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so now it's ne the next but step. She will wants to know about doing credit checks for the tenant buyer. So I would say um, tax return. Check the the bank statement just to see that they got the cash flow for three months, something like that. Yeah. Would that be sufficient? There's, yeah. There's, you can just do um, there's credit companies that I think they charge it's a nominal amount like 10, 20 quid. Just give the details of the uh, of, of the tenant buyer, and I think they cross reference it against national insurance. What's the company? Uh, there's loads. Just if you typed in credit reference in company, Equifax, tenant, is one, isn't it? Equifax, so, yeah. Oh right, okay. And they'll, they'll do they'll do a proper tenant reference in. Uh, yeah, and it's making sure they've got the monthly income coming in, the, the couple to support that payment. And then it's basically, okay, all good. Now the deposit's paid. Say so pay a deposit. So yeah. there's a tenant buyer heads of terms. I believe, Saida, you gave that to Jordan, right? The ten heads of terms for a tenant buyer. We uploaded that. Yeah, should we send that? Should we, if we send that, if you could just ping it over again and just explain to say sorry to send it. Um, and then, yeah, that's, that's it. They sign it, they leave the deposit, and then from there, it's basically, we instruct them as solicitor. There is an expert in. If they go, I want to use their own sister, then you've got to get them to basically engage with the official solicitor <laughs> that done her option, right? So Joe Bloggs here, get them to communicate. Yeah. Can't be the same guy. Yeah, but the person would do it, they probably should do you a deal. So the person that done her option should be out. Normally would. Yeah, they would do that. Yeah, so the person that draws up the lease option, right? They need, they're the specialist. So the one that done Jordan's lease option, yeah. Which lease option? Which option? The original option we had from the cell. Yeah, so. The option, <laughs> the option, the lead, the, yeah. <laughs> see this is confusing, but I had to keep things so simple. So she's got it under control now, but it represent, the represented the buyer, the, uh, the, the, sorry, the seller got represented by the solicitor, right? So that person, I mean, obviously it's been drawn up now, so they should be able to, again, do, they should be able to do a deal. There might be a small fee, but they should be able to basically get, make sure the tenant buyer has the option done with that solicitor. Yeah. Remember an hour earlier, who can tell me what the rules were? Win. No, tell me, yeah, yeah, we're gonna fucking win, yes? Yes, guys, yeah, good. So, what was the rules? Hour earlier, good stuff, man. Hour earlier, take a photo, screenshot. Yeah, five X the actions. Yeah. SMSs. Yeah, at least 10 SMSs. 200 plus. Um, Say that again. 200 driving dollars a month, yeah. That's awesome. Elimination? Yes, elimination, yeah. So subtracting things, getting things out of your life. So, for example, I talked about no TV. No news. No, news, no, no Netflix. <laughs> Norman, no, no, no even. <laughs> huh? No, yeah, exactly. No <laughs> bums. <laughs> just just mating. Yeah, but yeah. No sex for any of you. Yeah. But um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, I like to engage in that. It's fun. But um, <laughs> so basically, guys, just make sure you are getting rid of any distractions that would would be your excuse 
if before the mentorship to not be doing them. Does that make sense? So go out there and do it. We'll be holding you accountable. How will we be doing that? Over in the weekly webinars, we're also doing it. So me and Sam are going to be sharing what we're doing and you know, we're doing it as well. We're setting up some Google ads and we're doing some mail and it's, that's really it. And then we're just going to be making offers. Well, that's actually it guys. That's all we're going to be doing. So you can fight. We're in the journey with you, but make sure you do that commitment because it's, you've got to remember confidence comes from the promises you tell yourself and keep. If you keep breaking promises and going, oh man, you forget or you go, oh, I'm late doing it. I'll leave it. I'll just wait till the other guys do it. And if I see success and I might get back on board, come on, like, you don't want to be like that, guys, right? You want to succeed, yes, guys? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So the way you do that is by really action, lots of it. And good quality action. Have fun, yeah? It's going to be fun. Enjoyable. Come on, guys. You can have fun. You had fun today? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. yeah. Listen, it says bearded nutcase. <laughs> but this stuff works, as you can see. So, yeah, guys, it's awesome. So I'm excited. Well done for showing up. I appreciate it. I love all you guys. And I, I appreciate that you actually show up because that's how I can help you because if you don't show up in life and of course some people are actually sick which obviously it's not their fault but you make sure you want to go up guys because if you invest in yourself even you coming here today is a little investment in yourself and these little wins build up over a year these little wins build up if you keep sort of your lacklustered and you've got to ask yourself, guys, like a lot of people say, you know, they lose, I've seen this because we've had five years of groups, they lose the momentum. They lose the motivation, they lose that hunger. Because it's not because of the strategies or anything like that, because I know everyone in every like biz startup, Forex, Amazon, Shopify. I, I have some clients that are in Shopify and I say they're not, how are they doing? Never even listed one product. And it's like, for God's sake, like, come on, man. So it's, come on, what are you doing? It's madness. You know, it's, psych it's psychosis because you don't buy stuff and not do it. So these disciplines you're doing, guys, as uncomfortable as it may seem, are gonna, you're going to build so much confidence in yourself. And when you succeed in this business, which you will, that's my goal, you're going to crush it, okay? So that's only when I lose. When do I lose? When do me and Sam lose? When one of you guys don't take action? It's as simple as that, because that's what we're after, you guys to take action, because the more success you got, we have more success, and we breed success together, right? So good stuff, round of applause for you guys to shine up. It's been awesome, fun, love it.